Justin, sit down. <laughs> oh. Sorry. I got it. I'm working on two computers. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. On. It's Valerie from the Washington ADD. Thank you for joining us on your beautiful Saturday. Uh, you've got our implantology crew staring at you, and we're about ready to start their case presentations. Dr. Alan Yassin will be monitoring the Q&A, please. If you have any questions, he will monitor this and ask questions as he can or answer questions as he can. Um, your CE credits, as usual, your CE credits will come to you in a few days. Um, that for AGD members, they will be put on your transcripts. And then we will be sending out also paper verification PDF for your attendance. So please to be patient. It will come with you in a few days. We are expecting a very large group today. Um, so we're just asking for you to please hang tight for a few minutes while we get them on. We've turned off the chat feature, so you will not be able to use that nor raise your hand at this point. So if you have a question that you would like Dr. Yassin to consider, you can put it in the Q&A and he will take care of that as, as if time allows us to do that. So Dr. Yassine, I'm just gonna give him a few more minutes here. It's 9.27. We'll be starting promptly at 9.30 and people are joining us here real slowly. No worries, thank you, Valerie, appreciate it. I know that you have a, a course going on at the AGD down in the SeaTac area. So how's it going today? Everything it's is good? Going. Yeah, we have uh, 18 doctors here today, fully masked. COVID protocol, I took mine off just to say good morning to everyone. Great. Um, Dr. Hess is doing a Botox class here, so we are trucking along. Great, amazing. Thank you so much for your hard work. And um, the AGD staff and crew, everybody's doing great. So thank you, working on Saturdays, Sundays. I know yeah. last weekend we stayed until seven doing, doing our surgeries, so appreciate your uh, hard work. Uh, thank you, my friend. Back at you. We've thank got you. an amazing group here. They're making sure everybody is safe, feels safe, patients are taken care of, fever testing, COVID protocol, everything's good. Yeah, it was uh, amazing to see how the center was turned actually into very COVID friendly with all this work that you guys, you did separating the clinics, separating even the, uh, the audience and the lecture room with this uh, plexiglass thing, right? That's amazing, yeah. Well, yeah. everything to keep our member doctors safe and people safe, patients safe, so yeah. it's a good thing. So our numbers are clicking up slowly. If you're just now joining us, you are here for our, our case presentation by our rock star implantology doctors that have been in our program. We're very proud of them. So thank you for joining us. If you have questions about CE credits, your CE credits will be given to you in the next couple of days for AGD members. We will be posting that to your transcripts. You all will receive a PDF form that will be coming to you shortly. We are not using the chat feature today, nor are we using the raise the hand. Um, if you have a question, Dr. Yassin is monitoring the Q&A box. You can post it there. If you have the same question, you can upvote it so that you don't have to retype it again. So it is 9.30 for the courtesy of our doctors. We're gonna have Dr. Yassine take over. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on a Saturday. Thank you so much, Valerie, I appreciate your help. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know I have a lot of people watching from all over the world. Um, and uh, welcome to our live webinar from the implantology program, the uh, implantology, uh, clinical implantology from A to Z here in Seattle. We decided to do this at the end of the 2019, 2020 class before they uh, graduate next August, just to give the chance for the participants to have public speaking opportunity, discuss their cases, and to make sure that they have uh, the way of presenting. So this is what we call our program as, uh, as usual. It's a mini residency. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for the University of Washington for supporting uh, this um, uh, presentation. And of course, thanks for the Washington Academy of General Dentistry for the unlimited support 
to not only the implantology program, but also to other educational program. So this is our group for 2019, 2020, the doctors I'm gonna be introducing in a minute. We have also a great uh, team of uh, uh, partners to support us, uh, BNR, we have uh, BiHorizon, we have Action, Salvin, uh, Shamma Lab, Obad from, from Dental Lab. We have a great team in our course and absolutely our executive director, Valerie, uh, who is doing a great job following up uh, with everybody. So uh, welcome our class of 2019-2020. Uh, the program went uh, through a year. We started acad academic year. We started back in October. We went for nine sessions starting from a uh, very basic level all the way to June and uh, uh, to talk about complications, full arch uh, solutions and aesthetic zone as well. Unfortunately, as you know, in 2020, we had this pandemic, so we had to stop the last three sessions. We did some makeup sessions uh, in um, June, July, August, trying to catch up with um, what we what we missed. But in 2020, 2021, we have an amazing group of doctors joining us. What I did, I, d I divided the program into 10 modules. Instead of being nine, I added one advanced bone grafting, sinus lifting, and blood grafting full module. Every module is three days. We start Friday with a lecture. Saturday, we do hands-on and a live surgery. And Sunday, the doctors will be able to do surgeries under one-on-one -on -one supervision. So uh, it's a great program. If you, if, you, uh, if you are here in Washington or in the states around us, uh, um, or even we have Dr. Uh, Paulson is coming from Montana, just go ahead and take a look at the WashingtonAGD.org uh, website and you will uh, mainly find a lot of information there. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a great um, description for every module, so go ahead and take a look at it. And if you are on social media, you can join us at this uh, page for the uh, clinical implantology from A to Z. And the uh, Facebook page, it's implants course so go ahead and uh, follow it as well uh, the clinical implantology as i said it's really clinically oriented we do a lot of uh, uh, lecturing hands-on surgeries as you can see even myself can sit down and assist with surgeries for the doctors uh, um, you know the interaction between the the doctors and me is live uh, we have our camera to uh, broadcast the surgeries to the doctors in the lecture room. So we have a great technology set up in the center. Uh, our center is ready for uh, whatever we call it, the after COVID thing. So as you can see in the lecture room, we're very safe. We take the social distancing really seriously. And we have our uh, uh, separation between the audience, between the doctors as well. Even though uh, we took all this, we have the option of doing doing some online meetings. So as you can see here, Dr. Paulson is doing case presentation and me and Val watching him live in the same room from Zoom. So you can, even with the lecture, you can sit down back in your home, watch uh, the, the lecture in case you feel more comfortable and more safe to stay there. So we have a, a lot of support in technology. Uh, not only this, we have a great uh, a team of faculty members and and the guest speakers we had through the year. We're gonna get more surprises to come in 2020, 2021. Uh, this is part of our faculty members that they helped both in clinical and in uh, the lecture as well. These are our superstars. We call them the full timers. I'm gonna introduce them, uh, Dr. Nicole O'Brien, uh, who practices here in Seattle, Dr. Kenneth Howard, who practices in Tri-Cities, Washington, Dr. Sampara Deshpande, who practices in here in Seattle as well. Dr. Albert Kang, a 
who practices in a federal way south of Seattle, Dr. Preseth Kim On, who practices in a university place near Tacoma, Dr. Justin Paulson, who practices in Montana, and Dr. Tristan Stone, who practices in up north in Bellingham. Uh, these are our full timers. Uh, we have uh, the course is open for uh, a la carte uh, if the doctor feels like they want to take only one session or two sessions also we have uh, part-timers as well who comes uh, mainly for uh, one or two sessions as well so uh, as you see the doctors really get involved in treatment planning presenting a lot of hands-on it's more than a group uh, group work that we spend all the time the setup in our program is just amazing where I can do my surgeries and the doctors here in the lecture room they can sit down and uh, watch the surgery and uh, above that they can communicate with me they can hear me and I can hear them it's two ways communication uh, usually the surgery is done they are anything from simple straightforward implants uh, and all the way to the full arch cases depending on the level uh, of experience uh, for doctors doctors. Uh, not only science, we take, uh, we do a lot of fun going for dinners, playing some games, and most uh, importantly that we set up uh, both uh, twice a month uh, online meeting with each other. So mainly we meet uh, to treatment plan cases, make sure that the patients, uh, they are ready for surgeries. We don't treat strangers at all. So this is the summary for our program. I know a lot of doctors here in Washington, they are uh, familiar with the program. Uh, these are our uh, uh, superstars, full-timers. We decided to do this project before their graduation, as I mentioned, to make, to give them the chance to uh, talk about their experience and to feel the public speaking. I know we have almost two to 300 doctors registered for this webinar, so welcome everybody. Um, and I will start with Dr. Justin Paulson to start sharing uh, the uh, presentation. I will ask everybody to, if you have any questions, send us some questions to the question and answer. Dr. Paulson or every doctor will take 15 to 20 minutes to uh, present their cases. And then I will spend around five minutes discussing the case with them. If you have any questions, I will be monitoring this to make sure that I am uh, asking the doctor the question and have a, a small discussion. We already did block two hours for this uh, seminar. So we have uh, seven doctors. We'll try to be as, as efficient as possible uh, in time. So Dr. Paulson, if you don't mind, share your screen and the uh, podium is yours right now. Uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to do this. I, it's kind of fun to look back at that picture when I actually had facial hair. Um, <laughs> so somebody asked just a second ago, is this webinar going to be recorded and posted to the WAGD website? I don't know where it's going to be posted, but yeah, we're recording it right now. So we'll get it somewhere. All right, let me share my screen here. So all panelists, oh yeah, okay. Okay, here we go. So, um, like uh, Alan just said, my name's Justin Polson. I am uh, uh, over in Montana right now. I'm gonna be presenting a case that we did. This was actually in our first session um, with a patient of mine. Um, we did a, a couple of implants for him, and uh, what I did with our first session was a lateral sinus lift um, in preparation for the rehab of his maxillary arch. Um, today, luckily, we're presenting for uh, CE credits as well, and um, that's uh, what that lovely code is at the bottom. And um, if you go into this and, and uh, do this program, you're going to be doing a lot of presentations, and you'll get really good at it. So let's get started. Okay, so just introducing myself, like I said, um, I'm from Montana where I live with my uh, 
wife and two, two children. Um, I graduated from uh, the University of Pacific Arthur Tagoni School of Dentistry. Been placing implants for about five years. Um, I'm a CE junkie and uh, you know a complete nerd. So I've accepted that it's happened. Um, so introducing our patient. Our patient is somebody that uh, I've been seeing at my practice for a while. He's uh, he doesn't really have a very exciting medical history. The only thing he really has on there is a hernia surgery, um, but uh, he doesn't have any reported medications or allergies. He's an avid weightlifter, which kind of goes along with what you're about to see, as well as the hernia surgery. So he presented initially with uh, some shortened video due to his chronic bruxism. He's got, uh, we've been talking to him about doing something about it for years um, to prevent future tooth loss and to reestablish his video. His wife and daughter have been very vocal about him moving forward with getting the restorations done. His daughter used to work at the practice as an assistant and went to hygiene school. Um, and uh, his wife is just trying to get him to do something about it because he keeps on losing teeth to breaking them. Um, so he wants to replace his missing teeth and is aware after we showed him the x-ray and talked about it that a sinus lift would be necessary. So I warned him about possible ongoing issues due to his bruxism with regard to the restorations and implants uh, that we place just because, you know, he's an avid weightlifter. He's clenching and grinding all the time. Finally got him to wear a night guard, uh, which is great. And uh, so this is just uh, something that we're trying to do to make it so we can reestablish re where he was as well as prevent future loss. So this is initial, his initial presentation here. He's, uh, as you can see on the mandibular incisors there, he's got a lot of uh, labial wear and incisal wear um, from years and years of grinding. You can see the wear around here and you can see the chipping that's happening up on top. You can also see in the uh, premolar areas and molar areas that he's missing some teeth. Um, and so I'll show that here on the next slide. So this again is his initial presentation you can see his uh, maxillary incisors here have kind of like, they look like park benches, you know. They've worn out these huge notches. You can see his dentin. You can even see where his uh, pulp chamber used to be. I mean, he's, he's beating the crap out of his teeth. So uh, as a professor that I had at school used to say, he's, he's trying to eat his teeth at night um, and throughout the day, apparently. But um, you can see the missing teeth over here uh, in the back. He's missing uh, his molar and premolar. Um, but uh, let's look at his pano. So um, one of the things that you can see on here is, yeah, he's got some missing teeth. But what else is going on? You can see the, a little bit more of what's going on with the wear and the, the loss of tooth structure. You can see uh, the amount of bone loss at the air, in the areas of his sinus. Um, so he's got uh, a really thin ridge on his left side. So we are going to replace that. It's got less than five millimeters of bone. So we've got to do something there to make it so we can place something. Uh, so it has enough stability to do some good for him. And also I just wanted to point out here on the x-ray, you can see a widened PDL space. Now, why is that there? Is that because you lost the tooth behind it and now it's taking on more force. It's getting some orthodontic movement. It's widening the PDL there. Or is there something else going on? Um, he's also got no opposing on number two. You'll notice that later as we look at some of his restorations, why it looks like it does. Um, we may be able to do an implant below it, but that wasn't on the plan at this time. So uh, let's take a look at what we're gonna do. So, all right, so this is the important part. So for years talking to this guy about doing something about his teeth, he called me on a weekend and said, hey, I bit into something. I heard a snap and then all of a sudden it hurt a lot. So um, can you possibly see me? So I brought him in and you can tell right off the bat what happens. He split his tooth, um, it's really mobile uh, and uh, there's no way that I could do anything to save that tooth. So we pulled that tooth at that time and um, he's lost another tooth to a vertical root fracture. And now he finally has what he needed for years, some motivation to change. So. Next step, we got to do something surgically to prepare for the restorations. So we know already that we've got a thin ridge on the left side of less than five millimeters. A lateral sinus lift is needed. There's limited bone with a slant, slanted sinus floor on the space of number four. So in order to place something there, we're probably going to have to do a crestal approach sinus lift 
there. Um, and this is an old uh, pano here, so it doesn't look as bad on here, but when we took the CBCT, it's fairly obvious that number five needed to be taken out. It had a failed root canal treatment and a possible vertical root fracture, which, you know, as you can probably tell by now, isn't a real surprise. Um, so what's, uh, what are we gonna do about it? So we know what needs to be done restoratively, so how are we gonna get there surgically? So we've got this crestal sinus lift plant for number four. We're gonna do immediate implant for number five, and then we're gonna do a lateral sinus lift in the side of 13 and 14 for preparation of later implant placements. So in order to prepare for it, um, we had lots of discussions between uh, me and Dr. Yassine leading up to the surgery. Lots of preparing, going over what we're looking for, because uh, you know, as Alan, or as Dr. Yassine said, walking into this, you know, you don't want to be unprepared and he makes sure that you are. You're not treating strangers, as he said. Um, so I also, just because like I said, I'm a complete nerd and I like to read textbooks a lot. So uh, I bought this textbook and read it before. It's a fairly short read, it's easy. And um, it's a guy from UPenn. Um, he's, a, he's a faculty there, so he does a lot of lecturing and things like that. I don't know exactly his, uh, whether he's practicing or not, but nonetheless had a lot of good information in there in how to prepare for the surgery. So first things first, uh, I'm not talking about the implant placement today on the, on the other side, but I'm gonna talk about what I did, which was the lateral sinus lift. So first, what we need to do is plan our flat design. So what do you need in order to do a lateral sinus lift? You need to be able to see what you're doing. So you need a large flap that needs to be laid with adequate extension and release to allow for your visibility. Um, what we did there is we placed a vertical releasing incision just off center on the buckle of number 12 to make sure that it heals well and it doesn't have any recession where we did the flap. Um, we extended that along uh, number 12 in a sulcular incision going along the edentulous ridge and then back to number 15, a sulcular incision going back across the maxillary tuberosity with an oblique lateral incision just to get a little bit more release um, once we have separated the flap from the bone. So um, that gave us a lot to work with and will give us a lot of visibility. So what do we do next? So one of the things that um, I, like I said, I've been placing implants for about five years. One of the things I really enjoyed was actually the basic surgical skills. The first session, I learned a lot of really easy ways that I could make my life easier doing surgery. So one of the things that we did is as we're laying that full flap, using some tools and techniques that uh, Dr. Racine taught us in there, just to make sure it's nice and clean, that uh, the patient has easier time healing, keeping that uh, periosteum intact. Um, so we laid uh, that full thickness, thickness flap and released quite a bit of up the, the side of the maxilla. Um, and then we achieved that adequate release with techniques taught by both uh, Drs. Allen and Layla Yassine in the bone grafting session using different tools, our finger to try and get uh, our lovely blunt fingers to get a little bit more release going up, and then also visibility using sterile uh, gauze to um, help reflect the tissue as well as keep your surgical uh, area nice, clean, and dry. Uh, well, not dry, but, you know, easier to see. So this is what we're doing as far as creating the window. So before you even start with your flat design, before you even go into it, you need to know what you're planning on doing. So we're planning on placing implants. What size? What length? Um, how much bone do we need to accomplish that goal? Where are we going to put the borders of the window? So the inferior border is important. You've got to place that about two to five millimeters above the sinus floor. That's going to make it so it's a lot easier for you when you reflect that back that you don't have a uh, high risk of perforations. Um, you're gonna make the shape of the window the best you can. This one was my first one. So this one's a little bit, looks a little bit more rectangular, but if you can get more of an oval shape, it means that you're gonna have less sharp corners. It's gonna be less likely that you're gonna, you're gonna perforate that membrane again. Um, so another thing is uh, once you get that, that border set up, you've got your measurements down, take a high speed with a round bird, leaving only a thin amount of bone over the membrane. First time I did this, I didn't uh, remove enough bone right off the bat, which is not a bad thing because it's your first time, but um, you want to go until you have a very thin layer of bone over the top because if you go over to 
the piezotome right off the bat, it takes a long time. So the high speed is faster, more technique sensitive, the uh, piezotome is slower, less technique sensitive, and less likely to have a perforation. Um, but another thing to keep in mind along with your planning and making your window is something that uh, is a common complication is knowing the position of the posterior, superior, alveolar, intrabony, and anastomoses. Big old mouthful to say PSAIA. Um, and uh, it's a lot easier. Anyway, so that's the, uh, there's a little bit of an artery and anastomosis inside the bone that if you sever it, you're gonna have a little bit more bleeding. Um, and some patients, it's more of a big deal than others. So uh, let's see if I can get this to play. So this is the first little bit going in with the Action cube here um, with a diamond tip going around and just making that window. So this is kind of what it looks like putting a lot of saline in there, making sure that it's nice and uh, hydrated, and then also just removing the little bits of bone right before you get to the uh, sinus membrane and making sure that you have release of that window before you start separating the, the Schneider and membrane from, from the bone. So. Hey, Justin. Justin, can you hear me? I, uh, we can't hear you, me. Uh, so no sound. If you can just take a look into your mic, I can't hear you. Something cut off. Yes, I can hear you right now. Can you talk? No, somebody else. No, that's me, Dr. Yassine. Oh, yeah. Dr. I Fulton, think... are you still running two devices? You're muted right now. System resource and checking your audio quality. Yes, I can hear you right now. Yeah. You can hear me? Yes. Thank heavens. Oh, man. Okay. Where did I cut off? That's fine. No worries. Go back one slide. Yes. At the end of this, uh, the, we heard everything about this slide. So, next slide is good. Yeah. Okay. So, I was talking about keeping your uh, the corners and the edges of um, nice and smooth. Um, and then remove the sharp edges. So you want to make sure that the working end of your hand instruments is always against the bone. Is it working again? <laughs> it I don't just know what's made going it. On my microphone here. Okay. Um sorry guys. For some reason the only one that uh, has my microphone is going crazy and everything else. I'll try to get through the this really quick, so hopefully it stops doing that. Um, yes. Can hear you well, I think. Don't don't give it any shake. Yep. Okay. So um, anyway, so once you have these hand instruments in there, you're using the back of the instrument to push against the membrane with the tip of the instrument uh, going against the bone at all times, just to make sure that it's lower uh, risk of perforation. You want to separate that window from the the bone up on the superior corners of that window because if you do have a perforation you want to have it in that area so that it's easier to deal with because if you do it at the bottom you perf at the bottom once you lift that window it's going to be towards the medial wall inside the sinus and harder to deal with um, so anyway you want to lift in the superior direction allow for desired height of the implant and then this is what happens if you don't reflect all the way to the medial wall that's what it looks like you didn't get all the way to the end, and then it complicates the placement of your implant uh, later on. Um, this is what you do after that. You're gonna pack the bone in there after you've lifted the window. Usually, um, we added a resorbable membrane into the space covering the inferior, medial, and superior walls, and also just kind of the um, 
the memory of that uh, membrane kind of pushes up the window initially and it allows you to uh, make sure that you've got enough release and it also allows you to pack in the bone a little easier. It's kind of nice. So then you just add the bone to fill the desired space. Uh, then you close up. We added a membrane over the window and uh, tucked it underneath the palatal flat over here. This is actually two membranes, one going up superiorly and one over going over the edentulous ridge. So uh, now what you want to do is you want to check to see if you still have release of your flap, make sure that it's going to come back to its original spot. So you tug on it, bring it down into the place you want it to go, match the borders up, and if you need to do a little bit of release, you can release the periosteum a little bit in the techniques that uh, Dr. Eustine would show you in the surgical courses. So once you do that, uh, you get it, the match up the borders and you'd use a um, 4.0 ficral interrupted sutures along the edges where you're matching up the borders. So you just match the corners, put in an interrupted suture first on those spots, and then connect the dots with a, uh, a continuous interlocking suture along the edentulous ridge. You can use multiple techniques, but that's just the one I'm showing in the picture. Um, and then you close the vertical releasing incision with a 4.0 chromic gut uh, interrupted suture, suture for greater post-operative comfort and retrievability, you know, because it's the mucosa is a little bit more fragile and more likely to have issues and have a harder time to retrieve a um, suture if it's non-resorbable. So um, this is a pano after uh, six months. So you can see the two implants placed in four and five. The height and width of the bone increased in the site of 13 and 14. Um, and if you'll notice, more wear and breakdown in the dentition there. So you can definitely see that we've you know, got to get going on the restorative phase. So the restorative phase. So we're going to focus on the maxillary arch and number 30, just because we broke off the back of the two um, and want to establish a good video. So uh, Impressions were taken and mounted with a face bow. A bite was taken with the desired increase in VDO with the leaf gauge. And then in hindsight, probably should have used a, de a deprogrammer just to make sure that we're getting a proper relationship with the jaw. Um, I did not use it, but uh, I've talked about this case before with a lot of very intelligent people in the course, which is another benefit of being in this course is everyone's in it. It's pretty dang, pretty dang smart. So um, that was something that, brought, that was brought up to me that I should have done, and I agree. So uh, this is what it looks like after the crown preparations were done and the temporaries were placed. The crown preparations were and buildups were done. I had a reduction, uh, a reduction guide with a, uh, a clear suck down splint just to make sure that I had proper reduction for the desired video and um, make sure that I have proper aesthetics. So the temporaries were made with a PBS matrix made on the wax up. Um, and uh, the implants were temporized with a titanium temporary cylinder and opaquer with bisacryl, trying to get that lovely S shape right at the, uh, the gingiva there to make sure that we've got a lovely, happy gingiva. Um, so yeah, you'll hear that over and over again with uh, implants in this course, bone sets the tone, but tissue is the issue. So you wanna make sure that you've got happy tissue in the end. So the patient was asked to wear the temporaries for a period of four months to check for any issues of VDO. Some people go shorter, some people go longer with that. Um, from day one until just recently, he's told me that his bite is extremely comfortable and is excited to get his restorations. Um, so this is after doing some more preparations, refining the preps, making sure that I've got a good margin all the way around. Uh, I didn't have the uh, impression copings for the implants in this one. I ended up using the snap impression copings that BioHorizons has. Um, and so you notice that I didn't prepare number two because it has no opposing tooth. We actually had a plan to be taken out because it's not gonna be doing anything. But if we restore uh, number 31 below or we place an implant for number 31 below and we said and discussed it, um, we may just end up doing a crown on this one as well. Um, you notice I didn't put in a cord on number 12 and 15. That's because I wanna have a temporary bridge over the top of the implants placed on 13 and 14. Uh, well, I'm waiting for those guys to heal and osteointegrate. So uh, just basically what I just barely said. And for materials, I'm planning on doing a monolithic anterior cubic uh, containing zirconia for five through 12. So it's an aesthetic zirconia. It has a, a bit better flexural strength than most other, the other uh, restorations and a fracture toughness that's pretty dang good. 
And then I'm going to do the full tetragonal uh, zirconia on 3, 4, 13, 14, and 15. With the, so that's the original Brexter. It's, uh, it's a lot stronger, has uh, better flexural strength. Um, I'm just doing that just to make sure that I've got something nice and strong in the back. Something that's really strong in the front, it's just it's going to, you know, it'll look nice. You know, I want, him, I want him to look at himself in the mirror and just say, damn, you know, but uh, that's, that's the goal pretty much with all of my work there. So uh, the main thing is for him, I really want to focus on occlusion once everything is done. So what I'm going to be using is this uh, digital analysis, uh, occlusal analysis to be able to figure out how much force I'm being put on every single tooth figure out the timing, whether he's got any uh, lateral interferences, and make it so he's got equal force being put on everything at all time, make sure there's proper loading on the implants. Um, it's ideal for uh, distribution of forces and elimination of interferences. So that's one of the things I have planned for him. Um, I'll, I'm still working on the case, so if anyone's interested, I can give uh, updates. Uh, so uh, the, re the rehab from extreme wear and tooth loss can leave this patient in a difficult position where if we don't do anything to correct it, it's going to end up with somebody in a uh, removable appliance or, you know, some other issue that's going to continue to have complications from his bruxism. Uh, so with this, the surgical aspect really extended what I could do uh, with the restorations just because we're able to disperse those forces more evenly, spread them out, and make it so uh, this patient that has a history of heavy bruxism has a better chance of having less problems over time. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, I know that you had uh, two cases to present. We are uh, almost in 20 uh, over time right now, so it's 20, 21 minutes. So probably we're going to stop with one case. Uh, okay. I have, uh, just to make sure that we are on time for the other participants, Thank you so much. I know this is one of the first cases, probably in the first module you did, so uh, uh, the work is great. I want to mention that mainly what we do is we, um, uh, we try to encourage doctors to go ahead and restore their uh, implant cases inside their uh, uh, private practice. So mainly uh, they will be able to watch the results and they will be able to uh, follow uh, long term with the cases. Uh, I have like a, um, you know, the case, this case, Justin, the main concern is the occlusion, right? So before talking about mainly the small pieces of how to do the surgeries, the main thing is occlusion. Uh, the Take a, take a look at the big picture and you did a great job with this. I have one small question. What was your uh, material uh, uh, to use for bone grafting? What was the material of, of, of choice for you? And um, if, you, if you go over this, that would be great to cover. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, in the surgery, we used an allograft uh, and it was the, uh, um, the allograft that we received from BioHorizons, um, we placed in there we, with uh, just with, with blood as uh, something that was hydrating it throughout the procedure. So we gather blood um, from the patient as uh, we were laying the flap and getting everything going in an area that wasn't near the teeth, so it's not going to have a bunch of bacteria or anything in there, and then soaked the bone there uh, while we were doing the surgery. So by the time that we were ready for it, it was ready to go. Um, in some of the other surgeries, I'm sure that uh, you'll see from Dr. Howard, um, we use some different techniques to make it so uh, we'd have uh, better handling and uh, some enhanced healing using um, PRF um, and making some sticky bone. Right. Great. Uh, absolutely uh, great. Good answer. One of the things that I want to make sure that everybody uh, knows, uh, you know, this uh, famous study uh, by uh, Venus talking about the high risk areas for uh, membrane perforation. So can you just go over this? So when we do lateral sinus lift, um, just to make sure we know this piece of information. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the the main things that you want to avoid is uh, you want to you want to plan your window and where you go through the bone initially uh, and get into the membrane where you place those uh, those entry spots on the when you're making the window on the superior corners of that window. 
So on the top corners is where you want to have a perf if you're going to have a perf. Um, if you get it in between those two corners, it's a little bit more complicated. But uh, the worst spot that you can have it is on the inferior border of that window, especially in the corners. Um, because as soon as you lift that membrane, you can have um, other complications that start to arise as you separate it from the bone. That perforation can get bigger, which then leads to more possibilities of complications where you have uh, chronic sinusitis. You can have bone going into the sinus and blocking some of the drainage spots. Um, so you want to make sure that you plan for that. And then when you're breaking through that bone at the very beginning, it's just stay on those superior corners. Uh, initially, just to make sure that that is the first spot that you have a possibility of perfing, and if you can perf anywhere, you perf there. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. I have two uh, important uh, uh, questions that I have to ask because they're too good. One of the questions was, uh, would bruxism affect implant integration and stability on the long run? Yes. Yeah, and that's one of the main things why occlusion is so important. And during the period where we had those uh, those healing abutments to keep those forces off of there as those as they are integrating. Until they're fully integrated, they can't really take force. And especially on somebody that's going to be putting so much force on his jaws, it leaves a possibility to cause um, some disruption in the osteoid integration if he's biting on those areas. Um, once those rest restorations are done, you want to make sure that he's only contacting in those uh, spots only when he's clenching um, and he doesn't have any real big lateral forces on there. He may even want to splint those two implants together just to distribute forces equally and give it more support. Um, mm -hmm. Just like you would with a splint, you're trying to splint together those teeth to make it so those forces are distributed more evenly. Um, Putting those implants together does complicate the uh, cleaning of them, but on somebody that bruxes like that, it gives them a little bit more support. Perfect. Great. And the last question is, uh, uh, how did you determine... Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. The last question... You... Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the last question right. is, how did sure you... I wasn't talking to the void again. No, we we were good. Last question here. Yeah. It's really an um, interesting Any other discussion. questions, Dr. Yassine? Yes. The last question is, how did you determine his new video? And did you put him on hard splint? So how we uh, determined the new video was uh, basically trying to do a, a initial wax up where we tried to restore what he had lost. Um, and then measuring the difference between the two, which ended up being about three to four millimeters. So we opened up the bite by three to four millimeters uh, with a leaf gauge when we took his bite um, and uh, made sure that uh, we did, with the uh, diagnostic wax up, try in some, some temporaries for a little bit, make sure that he doesn't have any issues, kind of like you would for a denture. Um, then send it off to the lab for an even better, more beautiful looking uh, wax up, which uh, turned out very well just because of all the planning that we put into it. Um, we were able to get a nice result from it and I had minimal, minimal changes to make after those temporaries were placed because the, the bite was right on the money and that's just from using the face bow um, and all the extra planning going into it. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paulson. I appreciate your uh, help through the program and your amazing work. I know every doctor probably have done quite a bit of, at least right now, eight to nine implants or more. So you've done a great job. You referred a lot of patients to us. So thank you so much, Justin. Um, now I'm gonna welcome our- Thank uh, you. And also just, as I was pointing on this in the other presentation, so if anybody, if anybody thinks I'm too far away, my patients won't go to these things. I'm in Montana. I brought a lot of patients. People, when they know that they're going to get these restorations done, people will make it happen because they want it to happen. You have a chance to change your patients' lives. So do it. It's worth it. If I can bring patients from Montana, if you guys are in Washington or surrounding, your patients will show up if you, if you, have them, if you want them to go.
That's true. We had a lot of patients coming from Montana. And the good thing that we have not only uh, surgeons, uh, faculty members here, we have a lot of prosthodontists, for example, and general dentists that would help with planning uh, cases, even if it are complicated or straightforward cases. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paulson. I appreciate it. Um, now, just to catch up on time, uh, Dr. Dishpande is uh, a general dentist. She's a University of Washington graduate, and she practices here in South Seattle. So uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Dishpande, and please uh, share your screen right now and uh, looking forward to listen to your story. Hi everyone, um, are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay, Okay. so um, my um, presentation for today is about two laterals that we placed implants for. So I just, I'm calling it the tale of two laterals because I read a lot of books. Um, so a little bit about myself, um, like Dr. Yassin said, I am a new dentist and I graduated um, in the year 2018 from University of Washington. I practice locally. I'm an associate at a practice um, a little bit south of Seattle called University Place. And um, in dental school, uh, I knew I really enjoyed surgery. And um, I knew pretty early on that I wanted to begin training in implants. Um, I actually placed my first implant with Dr. Yale, uh, Dr. Alan Yassin's why Dr. Lila um, at the UW. And that was one of um, my most, um, it was one of the nicest experiences that I had as a dental student. It's actually an experience that um, UW provides to its students. Uh, not all of my classmates had that opportunity because they didn't really have patients that qualified for an implant. I was lucky enough to find a patient who had the funds for it and who qualified and I had Dr. Lila kind of backing me throughout that process, which really cemented our relationship uh, early on. Um, I am really passionate about dentistry and because I'm a new dentist, I know that I have a lot to learn in this field. Uh, for those of you who are dental students, I, know, I noticed a couple of dental students in the, in the program listening today. Um, one of the earliest, one of the biggest things you can do in your career is really align your goals and your vision with mentors um, who are in school with you or who are in your area where you want to practice. So for me, that was finding someone like Dr. Yassin, who is um, very renowned in the Pacific Northwest as a oral and maxillofacial surgeon and as a periodontist. And because I loved um, uh, implants, I was very lucky to find this program because I know he will be able to support me after the program is done. That's really important to me as a new dentist. Um, and because I'm passionate about dentistry, I'm involved in a lot of other study clubs in the area. I have a business study club that I founded last year. Um, I'm also part of Spear, which helps me kind of work on my restorative skills. And I'm an active member of the AGD. So uh, bringing that to the first case, um, this was a number seven extraction and uh, we were planning to do an immediate implant with a custom healing abutment. We always tell our patients that we will try to place an immediate implant, it's not guaranteed. Um, the two things that we are looking for in an immediate implant are um, bone to implant contact and initial stability. We have to achieve these two golden rules. Dr. Yasin keeps talking about them. Um, and unless we're able to match both of those criteria, we don't do the implant. We would just um, kind of put bone graft, seal it up, close it up, and wait a few months. Um, so this was a, a case um, that we actually did as a team. Um, I, I placed the implant for number seven, and my colleague did number 10. Number 10 is... Uh, obviously fractured up to the gum line, you can see that already. So there were two implants for this case. Um, this is the CVCT, it's a sagittal view. Uh, one of the things um, I realized is that um, you have to have a pre-op 
PA. Um, even if you have a CV scan, you might have a beautiful CV scan that things are very visible, but you have to have a pre-op PA because in this case, as you will find out in the next few slides, the angulation of the restoration was very different from the angulation of the root of the tooth. Um, all of the um, anteriors, the upper anteriors in this patient were restored, heavily restored. So that tends to confuse the dentist, the assistant, and even makes placing a um, surgical guide or working with a surgical guide very complicated. Um, and as you can see in the scan, because he had a ton of metal restorations in his mouth, it caused a lot of distortions in the CT scan. Um, what we know about this patient is that he didn't really have any medical concerns. He was had within normal limits, you know, past final medical history, had a low lip line, very reasonable aesthetic expectations. This is very important if you're looking to restore an um, anterior tooth, that he has a low lip line that makes your life much more easier. Um, from the CT scan and the pre-op PA, what we're mainly trying to do is evaluate the type of socket that we are going to place the immediate implant in. And there's a lot of research um, on this that's been done um, in dentistry. And uh, in this course, we talk about this research. Um, that's one of the uh, kind of what Dr. Polson also talked about. We, we discuss case studies, we discuss other lit reviews. So we know that what we are doing is kind of um, in line um, with uh, you know, what is expected. Um, so some tips to keep in mind when you're looking at an anterior tooth is trying to engage the palatal wall. Uh, you have to evaluate the tissue type, whether it's thin or thick. Um, and another thing is to really create a favorable custom healing abutment so that you can preserve aesthetics and create a beautiful emergence profile. Um, so this is a picture of uh, just me extracting the root. So what I did was we, we shaved off the, the coronal aspect. So it was, it was a crown, so that was pretty easy to get out. And uh, then, you know, you're, you're trying to elevate and create as atraumatic as possible of an extraction. Um, really uh, plan it in advance, go slow. Uh, so what Dr. Yasin says is go slow so you can finish fast or something like that that he keeps talking about. But it makes a lot of sense, especially when you're extracting an anterior tooth. Uh, be very gentle, clean the socket really thoroughly, make sure that there's no infection left behind. You should be able to feel the bony texture and um, ensure that there's no infection. Um, this is just the picture of the root tip that we got out. Um, I really wanted to share this picture. I could have chosen not to share the first picture, but it, this is exactly the reason why we take so many PAs. Um, basically, this is the picture of the initial drill um, where you, you really want to know, you know at which point it is angulated. The reason I wanted to share this is because after looking at um, uh, the adjacent two coronal restorations, that's why I placed my initial drill where I placed it. And when we took a PA, I saw that it is obviously super close to the implant on the other side, um, which is why we had to kind of change game plan and kind of figure out where the roots of the adjacent teeth were and then guide um, the drill in that aspect. So I ended up having to move very close to the canine, which you will see in just uh, a minute. So we use the 3.4 and 12 mm. BioHorizon has been a very kind sponsor in this um, whole experience. They have always had a representative uh, available at every session that have kind of helped us along the way. And um, that's the implant we used. And now you can see that the angulation is, is pretty, pretty good. Um, so in this picture, um, I have used a uh, temporary, uh, you know, a custom cylinder basically to make the custom healing abutment. And you can see that it's very close to the canine. And that's again, because of the angulation of the canine and the central incisor close by. Um, uh, they have been angulated just to create a more aesthetic looking restoration for this patient. And the lateral incisor that goes on top of this existing implant that I placed will also be angulated. So um, just something to think about as a restorative dentist, um, because we are the ones, if we are placing the implants, all the more important for us to know exactly how the crown is going to be. Um, 
And uh, the picture on top is uh, just a picture of a very handy little tool that BioHorizon has. It's just called the Abutment Preparing Handle, but what it does is it goes right into the cylinder, grabs onto it so you can hold it in your hand with the handle instead of uh, you know, using it with your fingers to uh, you know, make your custom healing abutment. So uh, I, I really liked it. Um, uh, this is me just kind of flowing composite all around just to get a good baseline. So once you place you've, your flowable composite, what you want to do is cure it. So at this point, after this, we, we kind of cured it. Um, and uh, here you can see that it's, all, it's mostly completely refined, the composite all around it. And uh, I'm placing an aloe dump uh, within the buckle pouch. Um, uh, you know, and tying it with a suture and getting it out from the buckle aspect makes it a very predictable and a very nice, reliable way to place the alloderm inside the buckle pouch. Um, and this is a technique that was taught by Dr. Yasin. And uh, lastly, this is just kind of me closing up. There's um, two interrupted sutures, mesial and distal to the uh, custom healing abutment, and then there's that one little suture around the alloderm that's uh, uh, keeping everything nice and tucked in. Um, and this is the final PA. Um, uh, you can see that the implant is at a very nice distance between the canine and the central. Uh, and uh, it, this is kind of the composite that flowed around the uh, custom healing abutment. Um, what what we are trying to achieve is actually an S-shaped curve so that uh, your, the gingival tissue around the implant can really heal up beautifully and create a nice emergence profile for your restoration. Uh, I did try to do that, um, but ideally uh, kind of the S-shaped curve is what I have drawn over the implant. Um, as you can tell, I mean, we are all, not all of us are beginners in this course. I definitely am. And, um, I had the privilege to learn from these amazing, bright, motivated uh, classmates of mine from the cohort and Dr. Yasin, along with some of the guest lecturers who came. So we're all learning as a group and we all learn from, uh, you know, the things that we have done in the past. Um, so why this course? Um, uh, of course, I did mention Dr. Lila, who um, I really respect. Um, she's a faculty um, at the UW. And, um, uh, of course, I must say that we are very lucky to be based in the Pacific Northwest where uh, the Washington AGD has really kind of spearheaded continuing education. Um, uh, the AGD, for example, during the pandemic when dentists were closed for two months, almost every day there was a CE course or there were two CE courses that were offered free of cost. Um, and they, they are really working very hard to help dentists and uh, Valerie is a big source of, um, uh, you know, big source of all of that leadership at the AGD. Um, I really, really love working with someone like Valerie. Um, and um, Dr. Alan Yassin, like I said, is uh, pretty well uh, renowned in the Pacific Northwest. And I really was looking for someone who will mentor me and who will help me after the course. Uh, before taking this implant course, um, I did a lot of research. I spoke to a lot of my classmates. I spoke to a lot of my seniors at the Utah, people I know in the U.S., um, asking them about the kind of implant programs that they take. One of the biggest things that I heard from everyone was the lack of support you get after you do the course. So usually you go to a course, uh, you pay, uh, and, you know, it's it, the course itself is usually always fun, but then after the course, it kind of, it kind of shuts down. And then when you have mis when, you, when you come across complications or mistakes, you really don't have someone to guide you. Um, that was really big for me, especially being a new dentist. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I took this course. Um, the course also helps you uh, figure out uh, how to manage complications and you have the ability to work on your patients, uh, which is really great because um, all of the patients that I brought into this course, um, now they are back in my clinic and they're getting the clinical restorations from me. And because they saw me working hard at the course, uh, they have automatically built better rapport with me. So they feel like, oh, you know, um, this new dentist, she's always studying, she's always educating herself, she's awesome. So it's, it's just a nice um, relationship that you're able to build with your patients. It will always help you later on. And um, 
uh, I also end up having, I'm just feeling a lot more confident in even doing extractions, uh, better suturing abilities and bone grafts because all of this is kind of reinforced throughout the course. Um, so uh, my overall recommendation is definitely consider taking this course. Um, even, you know, uh, even the cost, time and travel involved, every, it will, it will multiply in terms of return of investment, it will multiply 5x, 6x later on. So um, if you're interested in implants and surgery, uh, definitely take this course. Thank um, you so much, Sam. Uh, I, I know that you have the second lateral. Are you gonna uh, presenting really quick? We have almost, we have a lot of questions. Oh, okay. So probably I'm gonna give you uh, two minutes to go over the second lateral. Okay. before we start questions because it's a lot of discussions and I'm already receiving some interesting questions as well. Oh, so nice. go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the second lateral. Um, and um, this was one of my colleagues' patients. Uh, we uh, took care of number six and seven. Um, I did one implant and he assisted me and then, uh, you know, vice versa. That's kind of how we work in the program. We assist each other as well. It gives you the unique perspective of a surgical assistant and then you are able to go back to your clinic and train your surgical assistant the way you have done things. So that's super valuable as well. Um, we used a little restorative guide to kind of uh, figure out exactly where we want to uh, make our uh, initial drill cuts. Um, and what I really liked about the surgery was because um, we made those initial holes in the surgical guide, um, we were able to kind of make pilot holes so that even though, you know, my colleague was placing one implant and I was placing the other, we had an exact spot um, as reference uh, to work with. Um, uh, this, so this implant, at this point, my colleague had already placed number six and I was doing number seven. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it's not torqued down all the way, which is why there's a, a space, but it did get torqued down after this x-ray. And here we're just making, we're just kind of uh, extending this flap, uh, making sure it's, uh, you know, nice and mobile so we can provide good sutures. And uh, we placed some bone graft in there. And then we close it up with three interrupted sutures um, and uh, let the patient go on his way. Um, but yeah, this was um, my two lateral cases. Um, I would love to help with any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dishpande. I want to um, mention that uh, uh, Sam has a very great uh, enthusiasm about dentistry and she started this online blog that I discovered. Um, she, she does not really talk a lot about it, but I, I followed her online and her website is amazing. A lot of thoughts, a lot of uh, articles to talk about everything in dentistry. She already started practice evaluation series probably yesterday, so she's pretty active. So I would recommend everybody to follow her. She is smart, a new dentist. She knows her limits and she is willing to learn and to teach her experiences to others. So thank you so much, Sam, to be part of us. I have a couple of questions from me and I have a couple of other questions questions from participants, probably I will take over and, and answer them as well. What do, you, uh, what do you have to share with us uh, about the extraction socket classification after you take the tooth out? And how do you evaluate if you want to put an implant in this extraction socket or not? Yeah, so um, there is a research paper that we actually read. I think it was based in 2016 or 2017, but there's four different types of sockets. So type one, type two, type three, type four. And usually it's based on the uh, buckle wall, the length of the buckle wall. And usually uh, type four, for example, is a contraindication where there is barely any buckle wall. So if you if you do place an implant in there, the chances of the buckle wall kind of resorbing or of your implant failing are very high. Um, uh, in, in the first, in the first um, case that we discussed, 
uh, the buckle wall, it, it, even though it wasn't ideal, it was still within, it was bit between the parameters of type two or type three. So it was definitely a case that we could have done an immediate implant on. So um, that's kind of the reason why uh, we should look at um, research studies to see whether we are in um, reliable parameters. Perfect, thank you so much. This will answer one of the participants' question about why not to, uh, you mentioned that we don't promise patients to place Im immediate implants all the time. Uh, the doctor was uh, surprised about like, yeah, it's a routine practice. And his comment is inaccurate. It's the, it is uh, something we do all the time, but we need to know when not to do it. So there's a difference between the classification of where to uh, the alveolar bone position, the tooth in, inside the alveolar bone position, and the classification for the socket extraction. So after the extraction, we evaluate the socket. We see if we can achieve a, a bone chain plant contact, a, a initial stability, and then we decide if this case is 100% a good case for an immediate implant or not. I always say immediate implant is nothing to start probably with your first 100 implants. So if you are a, 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 you know, a new dentist doing implants, you need to make sure you build your regular uh, practice in uh, straightforward immediate Im uh, implants before jumping into immediate implants. Uh, another question here is, what the why did you place custom healing abutment? What's the difference between uh, what, where's the, what's the difference between the custom healing abutment and the solid abutment? So a custom healing abutment is something you want to always always try for an anterior aesthetic case. Um, like I said, in the first case, uh, because this patient did not have very crazy aesthetic expectations, he was one of one of the best patients you would want to have, you know, very low lip line and just very grateful for getting an implant and getting a restoration. Uh, he, he didn't have very many expectations, but that's not usual. Most people who are having a front tooth restored are going to have expectations of like uh, trying to minimize black triangles, trying to get a restoration which looks natural. So when you're trying to achieve that, you really want your, the tissue around the bone to help you. And custom healing abutment where you make a beautiful, like, like I showed you, the S-shaped curve, it will really help you um, get those ideal, as much as possible, ideal gingival area around your tooth. So um, in an anterior case, uh, I would always recommend uh, a, a custom healing abutment. Perfect. What's the um, the soft tissue support will support the bone underneath and vice versa, right? So um, that's uh, that's great. Uh, the last uh, question would be coming from Dr. Uh, Rusan uh, from Chicago. Thank you for participating, Doctor. Uh, she's talking about the case with two adjacent implants next to each other when you and Dr. Kang's implants. Can you put this slide again and talk about the emergence profile because she's asking about the final restoration. Dr. Rosen, she's a well-known prosthodontist. So um, of course, prosthodontists always will give surgeons hard time, right? So. Yeah, so um, for this case, we did utilize uh, a guide. It wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't a traditional surgical guide. It was a restorative guide. So that kind of helped determine where our implants should be placed. And um, uh, because, so some of the things that helped us in this case was um, uh, availability of good quality bone and availability of good quality tissue. Um, which was not entirely evident when we took a CT scan and reviewed the case before. But when we opened it up, uh, we saw that he had all of these biological factors that were helping, helping us in this case. So um, using, uh, using a restorative guide really helped us figure out exactly where to place the implants and to mold the restorations around them after. This case will be discussed, I think, again, uh, by my colleague, Dr. Kang, because this is his patient that we worked on together. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much. I have to uh, share with everybody here that uh, 
we have different levels of participants in our program. We have somebody who's been practicing for several years. Dr. Deshpande is a new graduate dentist, so also she went long way to, to do implants and even doing all this, uh, push the envelope and more advanced cases like uh, immediate implants. One of the doctors uh, asked about why not to do a full uh, restoration over your lateral instead of custom healing abutment. And of course, this is something we can do as a beginner, probably start with the custom healing abutment that will give you more, uh, more uh, security for the implant uh, down the line. Uh, one of the questions came to, to my way is, um, how about the partial extraction therapy and uh, the uh, socket shield? Uh, technique are you going to do it and uh, the answer for this is of course we have a huge portion of the aesthetic zone uh, module talking about the socket shield technique actually in the last year we did a live surgery for socket shield uh, this year we did not have a chance to do this especially due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and, and all this lockdown we went through but the socket shield is something we adopt in our course and we mainly teach uh, actively. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deshpande. I think we covered everything. Great uh, work, great cases. Still, you have uh, two more surgical days to go and um, looking forward uh, to it. Now, next we have Dr. Preseth Kim Oon presenting um, a wonderful case, a very interesting. So, uh, I don't give too much away. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, please uh, start sharing your uh, your uh, screen and uh, let's uh, have fun. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for joining us uh, on a Saturday. I know uh, you guys probably have better things to do, and uh, we deprive you of your um, of your uh, beauty sleep. Okay. So. My topic is CAD CAM in implant dentistry, although it's a very general term, but it's probably not what you think it is. So I just keep it like this and I hope I can catch your attention. Um, a little bit about uh, myself. So um, I, uh, I actually grew up in Germany and studied uh, dentistry initially at the Freie Universität in Berlin and then um, transferred to the University of Ulm, also Germany, um, where I graduated with a DDS degree in 97. And um, after two years uh, in practice, I went back to uh, dental school in 99 uh, at UPenn and got my DMD uh, in 2001. I started uh, placing implants regularly about six years ago, so in 2014. However, um, my first implant, I think, was about 10 years ago but um, I never received a lot of, um, well, a lot of support. So it just trickled away and I never really followed up on it until, like I said, 2014. And uh, that was the time when I actually took a course with the WAGD and that's when it took off with, um, uh, with the implantology. Okay, um, here's a photo of my family. This was uh, in Colorado at Peaks Pike, no, Pikes Peak. And uh, yeah, this is an area that I remember very well because I nearly threw up. You can see the elevation is 14,000 feet and for a city dweller like me, who is used to living at sea level, that was just a little bit too much. And uh, yeah, anyway, I have two kids. These are my two kids, uh, Charlene and uh, Tori. They're both avid golfers, playing pretty good. I myself don't play golf. I mean, I can hit the ball, but I never know where it's going. And um, this is my wife. And next to her, that's my mother-in-law, and on the other side, my uh, brother-in-law. One of my biggest hobby is airsoft. I don't know if you know airsoft, but it's like paintball, just I think it's not as messy and way more sophisticated uh, than uh, paintball. And that little dude, that's me in the background. We do have an airsoft club, an airsoft team uh, up north in Mount Vernon. And uh, we also do charity work like, uh, you know, uh, Toys for Tots or uh, food drives for the underserved uh, um, kiddos. And this is my beautiful staff. Obviously, I'm a trekkie, and this was a picture taken two years ago. And um, I was uh, editor-in-chief for Starfleet International, that is uh, the um, 
you know, the largest Star Trek fan club in the world for three years. And uh, interestingly, one of our patients is uh, James Dune's daughter. So if you don't know James Dune, that's the, um, the guy who played Scotty in the Star Trek original series. Okay, so enough nerdiness, right? So I'm introducing well, I, you, Brasseth. You have to you have to take us to uh, to the to the north and play this uh, pin, paintball or something with us. You you've never invited no us, right? So you're not gonna graduate until you do this. So <laughs> okay, well arrange a time. <laughs> everyone August. is coming. Everyone is coming back with welts on their skin. <laughs> okay, back to Nolan. <laughs> yeah. So this is Nolan. Okay, Nolan, uh, at that time, about five years ago, he came to our office uh, because he had a basketball accident and he knocked out number 11. Interestingly, he had no pain unless he was talking, so the pain level was only about a one. His medical history was non-contributory. He only had some uh, mild tenderness on his left jaw, obviously, from the accident, and you can see that he had some minor soft tissue damage. And that is what he has when you look into his mouth. So the second quadrant, yep, was uh, quite lacerated. Um, and like I said, he was uh, missing number 11, which was kept in a jar. He had very minor bleeding. And we noticed that he was congenitally missing numbers uh, 7 and 10. Mobility of number 9, uh, yeah, I would rate it as a plus 2. But the tooth itself was still mobile, uh, still uh, vital. So we left it as it is because at this point we couldn't do much anyway. The other teeth looked fine. There was no chipping or no other mobilities. And when uh, we looked at number 11, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, really salvageable. So the immediate um, treatment for him, uh, we suggested uh, socket preservation to at least maintain as much bone as possible. At that time, I used uh, osseo, uh, osseos powder uh, and covered it with uh, Sherderm. Um, the whole thing was then sutured with uh, polysin, which is, which is uh, PGA, that means polyglactic acid. It's a resorbable membrane. And this is the one week post-op. And as you can see, it looks so much uh, better than how he uh, presented uh, uh, to us at the beginning. Okay, so future considera considerations were, of course, orthodontic treatment once the area has healed. And then we talked about, you know, an upper removal partial denture, which is not a great solution for a young kid in his prime age uh, for dating, right? It's not super attractive. Um, he could get an interior bridge, but that would mean uh, losing a lot of uh, natural tooth structure. And uh, he didn't have any other fillings, so that would be a huge waste. And of course, the option of uh, having a bone graft and implants. So a few months later, he had his uh, author consultation. Um, there you go. But he did not start the ortho treatment until two years later. And that had something to do with his insurance. Uh, since, it, since it was on school grounds, there was a lot of paperwork, lots of bureaucracy. So I'm not going to go into that because I don't know the details either. And in the meantime, he grew a beard probably to just hide his smile, and maybe he just felt more like a man, you know? Anyway, um, as is expected, <clears throat> there still was quite a bit of uh, bone loss from uh, the buckle because of the um, uh, loss of the tooth. So about two years into the author treatment, uh, we had a consultation with a periodontist, and in this case, it's, these are photos from uh, Dr. Minu Kabash, who is a local periodontist, um, and uh, she took those uh, beautiful pictures. And you can see on the uh, lower side here how much uh, of a gap he has, how much bone got lost, unfortunately. And uh, these are pictures after debanding, and like I said, with a flipper here in the front, or let's call it retainer. It's not super attractive. We even had a smile design consultation with Dr. Hyun Ji Hyun Kim, and you guys might know her from her courses with the injection molding technique. And uh, the smile design had the advantage that we would know how much bone we would need uh, for the implants, uh, where to put the implants, but also to evaluate his smile. And, uh, be, you know, we wanted to make his teeth look a little bit more 
masculine. I know around in this time of uh, um, in this time to talk about gender, it's a little bit delicate, but uh, that's just a fact. And you can see his teeth are very slender. So it's just good to uh, visualize, to imagine what we could do uh, with his anterior teeth. Okay, so we um, did a surface scan of his uh, teeth after debanding and also did a scan of the diagnostic wax up in order to put this one or put the scan, the diagnostic wax, uh, scan um, over his teeth to see what uh, needs to be done. And you can see the difference uh, of uh, bone level from the left picture here, uh, this gap compared to this area here. On the side, it's pretty obvious as well. But like I said, it just gives us a good um, picture what we need to do in order to solve his case. Um, the actual CBCT scan uh, reveals how much bone he really has lost and you can compare the uh, right side to the left. I mean there really is barely any bone left and that's also obvious from the sagittal CBCT. I mean 3.7 to 3.8 millimeters of bone is really just the thickness of the implant itself, you know, of a small diameter implant. So this is another picture and you can uh, see here very interestingly, the canine is drifted a little bit into the space of number seven and uh, the orthodontist tried his best to tilt it back to more towards distal, but it just didn't work out. And he also had a retained uh, number uh, J, no, I, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, as you can imagine, bone grafting, implants, implant crowns, that's a major financial investment. And um, well, I mean, uh, family is a really nice family, uh, but uh, his mom is, uh, she's working in the billing department of an insurance company. And um, his dad is a retired truck driver. Uh, and he actually went back part-time just to pay for Nolan's treatment. Like I said, it's a really nice family. So I thought, well, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's a major investment. So in one of the lectures, I <clears throat> remembered how Dr. Yassin was showing us some fancy surgeries, you know, that involved a computer aided and manufactured bone graft. And yes, it was really impressive, especially to us noobs. So I thought, yeah, you know, let's ask him if uh, Nolan might be a good candidate for this course and say, yeah, sure. You know, let's try it. And that's how we started uh, treatment planning then. So, first of all, we have to prep the gum for bone grafting. Now you might ask, why do you prep a gum for bone grafting? How are they related? Um, that becomes uh, a little bit more obvious once uh, I explain to you the situation. And you probably know the, you know the famous phrase, uh, the bone sets the tone, but the issue is the tissue, right? And uh, basically it means that uh, you need at least three millimeters of keratinized tissue surrounding teeth and implants to have a good biologic width and to protect the implants and teeth. Now, when you look at the tissue here, he obviously has like five millimeters or so, so that's not bad. However, you have to visualize what you're going to do there. Namely, you're going to place a large volume, a bulk of bone in that area, which you want to cover. So you have a flap that comes from the buckle that will be pulled over to the paddle side. When you do that, you are moving the keratinized tissue that he has right now towards the palatal side. And guess what? Then you will have the mobile gum on top of the ridge. And that is not a good uh, material to protect the implant. So um, yeah, that's the uh, five millimeters of keratinized tissue. If you didn't get what I just told you, don't worry because uh, I will get more into detail. So like I said, we were preparing for the bone graft on 11 and, uh, 10 and 11, and uh, we fabricated an Essex retainer for that in order to give him some aesthetics. And um, it's also a great uh, band-aid for the uh, free gingival graft that we're going to place in that area. So this is the, uh, a donor site and uh, this is a four day post-op picture of him and the free gingival graft was placed there on the buckle. Now usually we do not do 
um, for the post ops, but he was just in the area and wanted to make sure that everything is fine. Uh, post ops usually, for us at least, it happens one week, post op two, and then four weeks. That's just my personal uh, protocol. Now you can see here all the sophisticated uh, suturing, and I'm telling you uh, that was beyond my pay grade. So uh, Dr. Yassin had to actually step in and do the thing. Um, yeah, I can only tell you, I mean, I've been extracting teeth and doing suturing for yeah, tw about 20 years. But when I went into the course, I really feel, felt like a super noob because there's so many little details that make your life easier. Uh, how to, uh, you know, use the direction of the uh, suture to lay down the suture, what instruments to use, how to hold it, uh, how deep to go with the suture, and so forth. So uh, just explaining the sutures would go way beyond the scope of uh, the presentation here. And um, uh, you just have to take the course yeah, in, in order to really uh, understand what's going on. So I learned a lot just from the suturing course. Yeah, and unfortunately, COVID happened. So we have not seen Nolan for four years, but he was fine. He didn't ha have any complaints. Four months. Four months, yes, four months, no complaints, nothing. And of course, we didn't take out the sutures, but somehow they disappeared. So the fringe uh, grafting area um, looked great about two weeks ago when we had him back um, to the clinic. You can see it's nicely pinkish, it's nice, fat and thick with nice vascularization. So despite COVID-19, we were still busy. That means we submitted the CBCT scan to, I think in this case it was Strawman, right? And Strawman then uh, sent it out to uh, LifeNet. That's Life, bone, LifeNet, right. Yeah, that's the bone, um, <clears throat> bone grafting company. So what does uh, CAD CAM with bone graft mean? I so want to like I I I wanna, I wanna stop. Uh, I want to make it a little bit different here with this presentation because it's a lot of details and I want to make it a little bit of interactive uh, discussion. Can you go back one slide back uh, just for the um, free gingival clinical photo? Yeah, that's here. Perfect. And what we want to, what we know that we need some bone graft augmentation, right? The first thing we say we want to do an implant. Remember, we had this discussion when we say, what's the classification of the ridge right now? Is it only horizontal deficiency or is it vertical deficiency or it is a combined both vertical and so uh, the ridge is really deficient and we have both vertical and horizontal now then the second question would be what options do we have for this bone augmentation right, right can yeah. we can do um we need to remember when we talk about the uh, scene style of doing this tenting technique over any bone graft right. to cover the bone graft, right? This is the main idea. So with those kind of complex deficiency or complex defect, we need to make sure that we have space maintaining, we have support, we have isolation, we have a primary closure, tension-free flap, all these things will lead us to have really thick, nice, soft tissue over the bone graft, whatever it is. Either we're going to do titanium mesh, titanium, uh, uh, titanium reinforced membrane, uh, non-resorbable membrane, uh, block grafts, block grafts endogenous, yeah. whatever it is, we need nice, what I call it, nice blanket to cover our bone graft. This is when we made the decision to do free gingival graft, nice results, amazing one. And then uh, instead of going with the block graft, regular one, we decided to go with the CAD CAM block graft. And now you can talk ab about it. Yeah, thank you. Very nice intro. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> We, took, okay. we, took, we, we did a lot of discussion on this case, so I know you you know all this stuff, right? <laughs> oh, sure, sure. <laughs> okay, so like I said, uh, despite COVID-19, we were still busy. And um, so what does CAD CAM bone graft mean? So you're all familiar with the CEREC uh, machine and how that works. So basically, you have a um, uh, bone block, uh, not bone block, porcelain uh, block, and you want to create a crown. Uh, so how you do that is you put a lot of eggheads into one room, give them some ramen to eat, make them a program uh, software that can then control a machine to cut that uh, 
porcelain crown. Now with um, with the uh, bone graft, it's exactly the same. And this here is my hint to switch over to a video. This is pretty impressive because, there you go, because a technician basically took our CBCT and uh, you guys know that uh, implants are restoratively driven. So it means he uh, virtually placed the uh, crowns there first, including the implants. So I'm going to speed up here a little bit. There you go. And then there will be a safety margin around the implants before he would then add uh, the bone on top of it. Now, this was only the first iteration. Uh, we then asked the technician to do uh, a new block on the computer because we have to account for at least 20% of um, loss, bone loss due to the remodeling. And it might be even more, but uh, yeah, I mean, this looks absolutely cool, super fantastic. And uh, if you have a, a block like this, that of course reduces the morbidity rate uh, for the patients tremendously, because the other option would be to, for example, take a bone block from your chin, from the ramus uh, of the mandible, or even maybe 20 years ago, or they're still doing it, uh, a piece of your hip, right? But like I said, that's a major inconvenient. Um, there you go. And this is the result, a beautiful bone graft in a sterile pouch. Um, on the day of the surgery, so Nolan uh, got numbed, we also um, used the PRF. If you're not familiar with PRF, I mean, this is plated rich fibrin, that's blood that's been drawn from the patient, but that's another whole big topic that's also been done uh, in the course. So that's pretty advanced stuff. Uh, we soaked up the uh, block in um, the injectable PRF, and at a later time, we also used uh, patient's blood to uh, produce the PRF membrane. So now, uh, the plant incisions uh, looked like this. So first of all, we're going to do a uh, circular, intracircular incision going way up towards uh, the buckle. And on the palatal, of course, you would go beyond the extension of the bone uh, graft. So you know the dimensions because you're measuring them beforehand, of course. And this is the, these are real life pictures. So took a blade and you go in, in down onto the bone, you uh, cut the parasteum and then flat back uh, towards the buckle. Um, in order to in order to have a nice intimate contact between the uh, the bone and the host bone, I removed, uh, you know, the I decorticized, decorticated uh, the area with an Action uh, machine. And uh, if you wonder why we should decorticate, there's a nice quote from the Journal of Periodontology, and I'm just going to read it. So basically, the biologic rationale for decortication of bone is to allow progenitor cells, easy access to a GBR treated um, site and to facilitate prompt angiogenesis. I mean, that sounds awesome, right? And that's basically exactly uh, what the decortication is supposed to do. And uh, for this procedure, I used the tip uh, of an Action Pusotome cube. So that's just the name of it. But uh, you can use uh, high speed, uh, round uh, diamond, and of course with a steady, steady hand to achieve similar results, but a lot of practice is recommended. And guess what? One of our colleagues, our cherished colleagues, uh, Dr. Kenny Howard, he was practicing a lot. And look at this, what he did. Yeah, lots of practicing. It's uh, motor skills that you um, try to uh, establish. Although originally, this exercise was meant for uh, lateral sinus lift access, but the skills that you uh, gain when you do these kind of, uh, uh, well, fun things, they still apply to uh, working on bone in general. Okay, all right, Kenny, I had some fun with you. There you go. All right, the next step involves the uh, cortical perforation with a round burr in order to allow uh, blood to, um, you know, soak up into the bone grafting uh, area. This is the big moment. So we took the uh, block, 
and slowly adapted to the uh, ridge. And it is amazing because when you put it in, it just fits like a glove. And uh, when you let go of the block, there is even so much friction that it doesn't fall out. I mean, of course, you don't expect the patient to jump, but the fit is really excellent. It's just marvelous. Also, pay attention to the perforations on the cortical bone, because I will go to that later. You can see they're pretty regular, uh, quite horizontal, and they can act for you as a landmark later on when you put in screws. Like I said, we'll get to that. So this is uh, from a different view, buckle and palatal. And uh, showing you some measurements because uh, there you go. Because this is also interesting to see where you can place uh, your screws. So, as a screw, these um, we have a pilot drill, and we determined from the measurements that uh, we would use two 10 millimeter uh, screws. Yeah, and it is important to spread the screws as far apart as possible to prevent rotation. That makes sense, right? To put two screws next to each other, you can rotate the bone. But you also want to stay away from the margin of the bone graft by at least three millimeters to prevent cracking of the bone graft material. I mean, I can still hear Dr. Yassin breathing over my neck and say, listen, listen, you only have one shot, one single shot. Man, he scares the hell out of me. Anyway, so uh, it looks like I did pretty well. That's how it looks here from, from the front. So that's uh, number one. And this is what I mean here with the perforations. Yeah, you can still see some perforations, which is important for the next screw. You know, one single shot, I had to do it twice. Imagine that. Um, and because I remembered where the perforations were and were, where the uh, margin yeah, of the arch was, um, I was able to place it at, the, at this level here. Okay, so... And the next one, uh, thing to do is, of course, to test how much coverage we would uh, be able to achieve uh, from the flap. And uh, as you can see here, it is kind of short, right? Uh, we have about yeah, seven millimeters uh, of gap. And that's why uh, I did some uh, horizontal releasing incisions on the buckle, but also brushed the flap with the instrument to elongate uh, the flap. So the result was actually pretty good. The, the approximation is much better than before. And um, yeah. Oh, yeah, now we're coming to the suturing part now. This is a completely different animal. And like I said, take the course. It's awesome. It's really a lot what you learn here. Um, notice how the suture was hooked up to the neighbor tooth, so it stayed out of our, uh, our way. I'm going to explain later why. So we added some bone particulates um, because you do not want to have that step between the bone graft and uh, the host uh, a bone uh, because that, of course, would rub against your gums. And it's not really comfy. It would feel weird too once it starts healing. Um, bone particulates were placed. And um, here are the PRF membranes. Uh, PRF, you know, just in case you didn't know, it just has so many uh, nutrients for the bone, um, has growth factors, works uh, in anti-inflammatory. And uh, this acts or this ha helps more the wound healing process itself. It doesn't do much for the bone, but uh, accelerates the uh, healing process. So now you can see what is happening with the uh, suture. You know, notice that the suture was now hooked off the neighbor tooth. And this cross, uh, crisscross suture works in a way that you first insert your uh, needle from the buckle, you go towards the palatal. And then you go back. And what happens then when you gently pull on the sutures is that you are creating pressure on the membranes. And that keeps the membranes down, right? So that's number one. Number two, when you start suturing or you start um, making a knot on the buckle area, you are lifting up the flap. And once you're able to do that, you get nice approximation. And this is the end result. And uh, for the suturing process, uh, we use two types of suture. So the heavy work was done by uh, for zero Vicro. That's the uh, absorbable braided suture. So it resorbs after, I don't know, four or five weeks or so. And then proline, um, 
which is used to approximate the margins and it's uh, way less traumatic if you use such fine sutures. Now, uh, let me go back real quick. Uh, when you do suturing, and yes, normally this is, like I said, uh, uh, another thing for, for the course, you notice how deep the sutures here were placed. Um, if you want to be sure, you can actually place several layers of sutures. So this would be the base la layer uh, to approximate the, um, the flap. You can put then a second layer to make sure that it's, it stays in place, and then you can end up with the uh, sutures on the side. Uh, let's see. So. Okay. So this was the day of the surgery. This is a few days ago, and we will have Nolan uh, back uh, next week for one uh, week post-up. And uh, yep, that concludes my uh, presentation. Okay, and yeah, we have a lot of fun doing the course. It's just amazing. So if you want to join, definitely do it. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Preset. I appreciate it. I think uh, we it's uh, it was. Uh, um, a lot of information. I know that uh, it's um, um, mainly uh, it's an advanced advanced work with doing this bone graft. We we uh, the good thing in the course that we don't have a single person or single doctor doing surgery planning cases. We plan cases uh, together. So uh, even when you do surgeries, you do it uh, together. Doctors will be able to communicate. So when you do you do this kind of surgery, we planned it all together as a group. I submitted the the design. I I am just supervising the whole thing, but we work as a group. Uh, that's great. I need to mention that um, I've been doing surgery only for the last almost 20 years. Uh, I do this every day, uh, all day, so I know for sure that being a good surgeon is two things. One, to deal, to know how to deal with soft tissue, and this is where we spend more time of how to dissect, how to cut, how to suture, all the stuff, because this will make you, put you in a different level. And the second thing is to know when not to do things, when to stop even before knowing how to do things. So this is what makes a difference between a good surgeon and a beginner surgeon. I have a one question coming from Dr. Safi asking about if maxilla, we have a good blood supply, do you think decortication is needed in maxillary bone with spongy nature? The answer is uh, we have different background in the literature. We have tons of studies. Decortication is big in uh, saying somebody with and somebody against decortication. Uh, for us, we focus on our bone block to survive. And for me, uh, some decortication will not harm. Uh, so why not to do it? So even with this kind of uh, a case, Dr. Presses went ahead with the piezo surgery machine. We removed whatever periosteum left on the bone, and we did this decortication again with this small uh, perforation, so it was worth it. I, I always try to uh, give more chance for our bone block to, to survive. Um, thank you, Dr. Preset, again. Yeah, yeah. And if I might say, we also wanted to uh, clean the bone surface so that there was no um, periosteum left, which would, Correct. of course, increase then the contact to the uh, donor Correct. Uh, bone. Correct. Correct. One of the most important thing with this customized allograft bone block is to have this adaptation right between two surfaces that we discussed. And you could see, remember this uh, picture that we put, it goes as a glove. So looking forward to more advanced cases like this. Thank you, Dr. Presseth. Uh, we're running over on time now. I'm going to welcome Dr. Albert Kank. Uh, he's one of our superstars as well in the program. He practices down here in Seattle, uh, in Federal Way, South Seattle. So welcome, Dr. Kang. Please feel free to share your screen. Great. All right. So thank you for that uh, introduction, Dr. Yassin. Mm -hmm. So um, this is my presentation. Uh, it is on implants on sites six and seven. 
Um, and Dr. Sam already talked a little bit about this case. Uh, she helped me, uh, she assisted me during the surgery and um, she placed the implant on site number seven. Uh, but I'm gonna just go more into detail about all the work that we did to plan for the surgery and all the challenges we had. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Midwestern University in 2015. I currently work as uh, the dental director of a nonprofit dental clinic that serves the needs of the geriatric population. So I have a lot of patients who are partially and completely dentulous. Um, I've been referring out my implant cases to my local oral surgeon and periodontist. And after years of referring these procedures out, I felt like it was time for me to learn how to do these myself. So that's kind of what brought me to this program. A um, little bit about my case here. Uh, so the patient of record um, presented with a loose cantilever bridge extending from tooth six to cover site seven. Um, clinical exam and radiograph confirmed um, clinical crown fracture at the gingival margin of tooth six. So uh, that gives us a hopeless restorative prognosis. Uh, I completed a surgical extraction, um, but uh, no site preservation was provided at that appointment due to the patient being set on a removal prosthesis for his final restoration. Uh, we did deliver a two tooth interim partial denture uh, post extraction just to keep up with this aesthetics demands. Um, and after a few week, months of healing, and using this uh, flipper, um, he changed his mind and he wanted to go with something fixed. Um, he did not want a bridge, so really the only option left was implant supported crowns there. So medical history, uh, the patient is a 75 year old male with controlled high blood pressure and he has had stable health for many years uh, and no known allergies. So just a very um, common set of medications for an elderly gentleman there. Um, nothing too, too crazy. So here's some radiographs. Um, the one on the left is his um, PA from the limited exam. And as you can see here, you see that nice fracture line there. So um, we surgically extracted that tooth and this is about six months of healing. Looks pretty good. And just wanted to show real quickly, just, you know, set of his other x-rays. He has a lot of dental work. Um, and he's able to maintain them. So, you know, he's a good patient, hygiene's good. Um, so we're good to proceed on. So this is just some photos of the patient, you know, just, um, just, just giving me a normal smile. And on the right, I'd really had him try to give me a big, big smile there. So I would just try to see kind of this aesthetic demands there. Um, you'll see pretty soon uh, what we're dealing with with this next photo. So we do see a, a, a good amount of concerns here. Right. Uh, obviously, his chief complaint is just that missing side on six and seven, but uh, we see uh, a whole list of other issues going on in his mouth. And when you have a patient like this, you know, you're kind of torn. You know, do we go with like a full uh, rehabilitation, try to you know, fix everything or just really focus on you know, the problem itself? And you know, a lot of patients aren't up for the full mouth rehab. So we just try to, you know, obviously talk to them about it. but you know, settle on what they really are, are okay with doing. So there's just some more photos. This is the occlusal photos here. And, um, you know, some things of note, you know, there's a little asymmetry you can see and on the left side, you know, the, they're, on the contralateral side, there's three teeth, but you know, there's really only space for two here. It's missing one of his incisors. So, you know, the space of his arch is just not as ideal. And these are his photos on the left and right side. And, you know, we have issues here with uh, inner art space as well. And, um, and of course, severe overbite there, right? Um, so moving forward, uh, this is just his cone beam that we took. Um, we're looking at both sites six and seven. So first with six, uh, we have about six millimeters buccal lingual width and apical coronal. We have a good amount of length there, more than 15 mil, so that's not really a concern. And on site seven, we have a little less, about 4.5 mils uh, buccal lingually, and we still have a good amount of width, uh, I mean depth, apical coronally there. So uh, 
just looking at our cast, you know, we're concerned about space um, because we're trying to fit these restorations uh, to make sure that we have enough clearance and also uh, space between teeth and the implants themselves. Um, so, you know, we did some rudimentary measurements and we did some math. So total interarch space from mesial of tooth four to distal of eight was about 13 millimeters. We want about you know 1.5 mils between the tooth and the implant, and we we're going with the 4.2 millimeter diameter implant for site six, which is typical for that. We want three mils between that implant and whatever we put on the lateral, which we plan for a three, mil, uh, three millimeter diameter as well, and then another 1.5. So that gets us really close. We're at 13.2 millimeters uh, total there. So, you know, once again, these are our challenges of the case. You know, obviously, the severe overbite um, and, you know, occlusion concerns, which is definitely the probable cause for the failure of the previous cantilever bridge. Uh, lack of interarch space, uh, mesial distal space for the implants, buccal lingual width to support implant on site seven. Uh, due to him having a cantilever for many years with, which probably had contributed to the resorption there of the thickness. Um, and, you know, this whole time I was thinking possibility of, you know, this might be a case to explore the ridge split or do some kind of ridge expansion um, because we have some cool toys at the AGD and Acteon is one of those. So just some things I was kind of thinking about while treatment planning here. Uh, but for the plan, you know, I definitely wanted to go with a digital wax up and a guided implant placement there just because, you know, we're dealing with a tight space and, you know, we're trying to be as precise as possible. Um, I was thinking about placing implants slightly more buckle to accommodate more for that mesial distal space concern and also to possibly get more inter-arch space with the restoration. Uh, discussing these challenges with the patient, he even volunteered, you know, why don't you adjust the opposing arch? And you know, that's obviously not a thing we like to ask of our patients, but when they volunteer, hey, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so yes, we, want, we want to take uh, extra care with our final restoration. So we discussed splitting the crowns, um, trying to go for group function, which is you know, multiple simultaneous contacts during lateral movements uh, to distribute occlusal forces. Um, and even with those forces, you wanna minimize occlusion during heavy function uh, and no occlusion on light function. So check occlusion during all eccentric movements um, and obviously finish with a night guard here. So uh, life happens, uh, we have unexpected things that can occur and uh, his surgery was actually pushed up. So we did not have time to do any digital wax up or uh, make a surgical guide. Um, we still wanted a restorative guide. So I had my local lab wax up ideal restorations and we fabricated a suck down back and forth matrix uh, to aid in visualizing our final restorations during our surgery uh, appointment. Um, and I definitely told my lab to articulate as best as you can, you know, hand articulate to try to minimize those functions there with those waxed up teeth. So here is our suck down um, in place. And you, know, you can kind of see slightly, the position is a slightly more buckle there on the restoration, which you can kind of see on the contralateral side as well. And it kind of follows that same curve um, so I wanted to go over my flat design, you know, uh, you know with, with the sulcular incision and across the alveolar ridge going back sulcular and doing a dog leg incision and a vertical releasing incision over here. Um, you know, you're going to see later, uh, but, you know, if I could do everything, I would have placed that incision a little bit more palatally so I could have more access. Um, this palatal portion of the flap would constantly was kind of closing in onto my surgical site. So it was a little annoying, but you know, we got through it. Just, um, so here's our uh, picture of our flap and we just placed a shallow osteotomy, probably about seven millimeters, um, paying very close attention to distances and spaces here. You know, this accounting for the uh, diameter width of each of the implants there. 
and space in between. Um, just looking at the picture, you probably notice uh, you could definitely position it a little bit more palatally, which we did correct for later on. But you know, mainly, we're, I was really focused on measurements you know, of the distances between the mesial distal. So I believe Sam showed this uh, radiograph, but this is just you know one of the steps we took. Shallow os osteotomy, just checking you know our space, making sure that we're in the right area. Uh, with with the patient, it's kind of tough. With these X-rays, you'll see, you know, he had a very shallow palate, and with these long pins sticking out, makes it even harder to get a good, you know, perpendicular X-ray there. But we just did our best. So um, this is uh, we started with site number six, and we prepared up to the the, um, the length and the width that we're looking for for our implant. Uh, this was right before, you know, this is our final drill, and you could all already see the angulation needs some work. Um, and this is also obviously a really good reason to check throughout your surgery, just to make sure you can make corrections along the way. Um, so, you know, already I knew from, after looking at this x-ray, we need to position this, angle this more mesially to correct for that. Um, and also, hey, we have our suck down, we got to refer to that too. So and never forget our final restoration. So we used um, the suck down and um, you know, after correcting that angulation, um, looks pretty good when we're you know, considering our final restoration in mind there. And that's uh, the final PA of the implant placement, looks pretty good. And then this is uh, where Sam kind of uh, Dr. Sam talked about um, her doing site number seven. You know, she uh, took over the surgery from this point and she placed a nice implant as well. These are our final um, dimensions here for each of the implants. It's 4.2 by 12 and 3.4 by 12. And our final radiograph. Um, yeah, and her healing abutment, yeah, she did tie it down a little bit more. So after surgery was done and implants were placed, we put the matrix back also again, just to see how it looks in relationship to our final restoration, our planned final restorations. And this is our buckle view. Um, you know, occlusal view there, you know, we see, actually we had some pretty good bone to support this, both, uh, both implants there. Um, you know, cone beam CT, I feel like, you know, we were definitely more concerned about how much bone we would have to support these two implants. But once we actually did, were able to access all of the, the bone through the flap, you know, we had a pretty nice surprise there. And I feel like you know, that's, that's another thing I'm going to talk about later. Um, but yeah, we, we had a pretty good result with our final placements there. Um, just added some allograft and a collagen membrane just to support our implants. Um, not really to build up the bone, but um, you know, just to give it a little extra added support there. So it looked pretty good. Uh, and finished up with um, primary closure and tension free flap. Uh, it looked like we did, we did a mixture of chromic gut and PTFE. And we did a 24 hour follow up. Um, and just I wanted to assess his discomfort. Uh, well, this was a week, uh, Saturday, a Sunday surgery, so I didn't have my prescription pad with me. Um, and he reported minimal discomfort, and he actually played a round of golf prior to his follow up appointment. So I think he's doing pretty good. And he just managed with uh, this over the counter medication for pain. So, pretty much, you know, just uh, thinking back, you know, what did I learn from this? You know, we originally planned for a digitally guided surgery. Uh, but, you know, a good foundation on implant training is definitely more important than reliance on technology. You know, we learned that um, even after doing all the digital wax and surgical guides, sometimes guides don't feel right or they don't fit right. They're not as good as we would imagine. So we end up abandoning those guides in those circumstances. And um, that mainly is due to because there's so many steps in fabricating a guide. That means with all those steps, there's a lot of potential for error to be introduced. Um, 
So it's always good to understand the basics, have a good foundation, and be able to proceed with the surgery if technology fails us. Um, and also, you know, releasing the, after releasing the flap, you know, we're able to visualize and reassess all the measurements of the bone. So I'm surprised to see that we had more space than initially thought, which I feel like, you know, retrospect is probably user error. So uh, it's a happy surprise there. Um, in terms of, you know, our, our my experience in the program so far, um, I feel like my confidence in surgery um, has increased, you know, significantly. Um, just managing with soft tissue and you know, flat design, and you know, I, I've never laid flaps this big, and you know, my blood pressure was pretty good throughout <laughs> the whole program. So I feel like that confidence really helps you all that. Um, and the, the course is really thorough. There's a wealth of information that we learn all about, you know, the, from beginning to end, you know, A to Z, as the as the course is called. Uh, but also think, you know, there's so much value that you get in the classmates too. They all come from, you know, different, you know, areas of uh, dentistry, and they come with all kinds of experiences, and that in and of itself is extremely valuable. So. Um, I highly recommend the course if you're considering it. Thank you so much, Albert. Uh, I have to uh, mention again, as Dr. Kang said, we we are as a mini residency here in our program. We live as uh, residents, not only uh, planning to, like only individual cases, we are as a group. So I have to say that uh, Dr. Kang, when he came first to the program, uh, we knew that he works with uh, uh, elderly with a lot of uh, full arch cases. So, um, and he did not really have a lot of uh, surgical background. So I'm so proud of his level starting from really a uh, very beginner level. Now he's able to even uh, deal with complications. Last case you did when you did this four locator implants, you managed this really well. So we tried to focus on what will benefit the doctor uh, most. And uh, for me, when I knew that he, he really works with a lot of uh, uh, older patients, we focused on uh, a lot of edentulous arches. So, so proud of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Albert, for your Thank presentation. You. Uh, and uh, looking forward to your other, um, we still have a one session coming on August uh, 15th and August uh, 16th. We've, we've planned a lot of surgeries. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to uh, supervise your surgeries as well. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have uh, questions from the participants. Uh, you answered the question about mainly the uh, uh, emergence profile uh, with with this uh, two next door implants. I just wanted to ask one basic question about when you have really limited um, both mesial distal uh, space and uh, some occlusal space. What are the numbers that you're looking for to place an implant? Uh, what what space do you need to leave between implant and next door implant and, and sure. tooth? Or what's the occlusal space that you're looking for to be able to restore these implants safely? Uh, so yeah, uh, between tooth and implant, you want 1.5 to 2 millimeters. Um, between implant to implant, you want 3 millimeters. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it depends on the type of restoration um, that you're going for, uh, for inter-arch space, you know, if it's mm -hmm. going to be screw retained or cement retained. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to, you know, I have to review that number again, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, that, it really depends on the restoration there. Um, right. What's, what's the restoration you planned in this case? Uh, you were able to put uh, nicely the implants in the position. So I think having screw retained, uh, mm -hmm. restoration and uh, probably seven millimeter will be more yeah. than enough for for this uh, for, right. uh, the thing is always thinking in the big picture we don't mm -hmm. really want to think only about uh, drilling and filling the implant in the hole we want to think about more interdisciplinary approach for every single case 
Um, so, yeah, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Good job, everybody. And uh, the next uh, presenter would be Dr. Tristan Stone, who uh, came to the program uh, with some uh, background in implants and his partner already took the, the course the year before. So um, uh, he practices up in Bellingham and eventually I'm, I saw him also going through a lot of uh, advancements in the surgical skills. So welcome Dr. Stone and please go ahead and share your screen. All right, thank you. One second here. All right. You guys able to see that all now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to be talking about one of the cases that uh, I had a patient come in from one of my practices to do. Um, we're looking at doing an implant in 19 and 20 areas, and then Dr. Howard uh, helped out on this case as well, and uh, he did immediate implants in number 29 and 30 areas. So just a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm up in Bellingham, is where I live with my wife and my four-year-old son. Um, I currently work in Anacortes one day a week and Cedar Woolley four days a week with an associate at her practice. Um, I graduated from Longwood University in 2012. Um, and I've heard there are several students on the uh, webinar. One thing that I did that I would highly recommend is the National Health Service Corps Scholar Program. Um, it is similar to the military scholarship programs. Um, only you stay local here and you can basically work in an unserved area. So I happen to go to a spot where um, basically Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia meet. And it was a good experience. It was um, very interesting. You know, a lot of extractions, a lot of massive fillings that really should have been crowned, but just financially, the patients weren't able to, to do that. Um, so a really good experience. I'm going to look into if, if you haven't already. Um, as far as my background with implants, we talked a little bit about it uh, at one window as far as didactically, but, and we had, you know, uh, you know, labs where we did things on plastic models and whatnot, but really, you know, like I said, I graduated in 2012, really weren't doing a whole lot at that time. So um, from a practical perspective, I was doing some implants, but before the scope, I had not placed any, uh, any implants at that time. So. Um, my patient, uh, like I mentioned, ended up coming from the civil war practice. Um, you know, I've seen him a couple times. Uh, healthy, thankfully, uh, no medical issues, not getting any medications. Um, we talked previously, and basically, he he had uh, some missing teeth. He had a couple bridges. Um, the big challenge was he really didn't have molars that lined up. You know, he had upper left molars, lower right molars, but no uh, opposing molars. Um, so we talked about, you know, possibly doing a, a partial. Um, wasn't real excited about that. Was interested in doing some implants potentially, but, you know, just really, you know, part of its finances, part of it's just, you know, kind of, I think probably a bit nervous about it, et cetera, until number 29 broke. And that um, really helped motivate him. You know, a lot of times our patients, um, I think know they know what they need to do. It's just they really, you know, they procrastinate. And I'd be lying if I didn't say I procrastinate myself. So, you know, I think that's a, a normal, normal situation. But this is this is what his situation looked like. Um, so as you can see, the bridge um, in from number four to six um, in the upper right, bridge um, 11, 13, and 15 in the upper left, um, missing the teeth. Um, opposing that. And um, as you can see in the lower left picture there, uh, number 29 just broken into some line, pretty much just not restorable. Um, and this happened um, not that long before the whole COVID situation happened. So we were originally planning on 
uh, doing this case at the United States in the April session, but that got scrubbed and um, we were able to do online work, which was nice. Um, you know, thank you to ABD for all the uh, webinars. Um, I know I you know, found that very helpful for keeping my sanity during uh, the whole uh, shutdown and whatnot. Um, but looking at the films, um, basically the, uh, this is a little bit earlier, but you see there's some uh, decay on number 30, kind of mesial area there. Um, and also, you know, it has a short root. The root canal, um, you know, looks like it's had some issues there. Uh, so that was something that we knew was long-term not a great uh, situation as well. And we really talked about that, but once again, it really took number 29 breaking uh, before he was uh, really motivated. When I had originally talked to him, um, I mentioned the possibility of doing an implant bridge on the lower right, uh, sorry, lower left area. Um, so that's kind of what I had kind of gone into thinking that we put a implant back in the say 18 area and then also in the uh, 20 area and just a, a pocket in between. Um, he was very blessed in that he has lots of bones. You know, that's that's not an issue for him. The challenge though becomes uh, a situation where there's not a lot of interpretable space in the posterior. And also because of the amount of bone, the implants would be at two different levels, which would make um, keeping things clean uh, a bit more challenging. So we ended up deciding to alter our plan a little bit and just doing two individual implants uh, in the 19 and 20, um, just to uh, keep things a little bit more simple, um, a little bit uh, less uh, height difference between those two compared to if we went back to 18. And then also um, you know, having the, the two teeth um, individual, you know, he's, he's got a pretty strong butt. And so um, that, that just kind of helps keep things uh, a little straightforward there. So the plan um, for number 19 was a 5.8 by 10.5 um, Fire Horizons implant. Um, as you can see from the dimensions there, you know, the width is about uh, 15 and a half, the length down to the nerve is about 17. So just lots and lots of bone, which is really nice. Um, you can see the nerve um, appears to be um, the mental nerve uh, kind of coming out close uh, on the panel. It looks a little bit questionable, but when you look at it from the uh, sagittal, you can see uh, lots of space there. So uh, once again, that was a 4.2 by 10.5. Um, and then on the lower right, like I said, kind of what spurred him to, to action, uh, number 29 in the Drumline and then 30 Reformation had the uh, history of root canal that had some uh, Quality happening going on, as well as they decay at the, the mesial buckle. So, uh, as far as the actual implants, um, 29 is planned with a 4.2 by 12, and number 30 with a 7 by 9 millimeter. So that's a really, really fat implant, um, but which is really good for uh, allows us to do um, treatment that might uh, otherwise be more challenging. So, as far as the actual um, surgical part of the case, this is the side that I did, like I mentioned, number 19 and 20. Uh, you can see in the first radiograph there, uh, my angulation is clearly off. And so we ended up re redoing that osteotomy, uprighting that a little bit more, so we got a little bit more uh, parallel, um, a lot better spacing between the adjacent tooth and the number 19 implant as well. So uh, yeah, basically got that down and in, and uh, that can see for that. I don't have the, the photos of that. Uh, but that uh, essentially is what, what we had um, going on in this perfect case. Like I said, uh, Dr. Howard is going to speak a little bit more on the uh, other side. Uh, but once again, as far as the, the class itself, I, you know, beyond just the implants, you know, I felt a lot more comfortable um, just with surgery in general. You know, Dr. Yusin was great in that, you know, we, we did, you know, several uh, cases of third molars. You know, patients needed some implants, we needed third molars out also. You know, just a matter of getting, you know, helping the patient out as much as we could. And so it was good learning from some uh, some tricks as far as surgery. Um, you know, my suturing, I'd say, just was probably the single biggest, um, you know, from a day-to-day -day type perspective. You know, I, I used to, you know, I, I I know how to suture. You know, I've, I've sutured some, you know, back in, in Tennessee and whatnot. But 
you know, it was one of those things that I would somewhat avoid, whereas now I, I kind of look forward to sleeping. So I know that I can do it quickly. I can be efficient with that. And I know it's going to end up holding well. So uh, with regards to the course in general, um, you know, it's, it's been great. You know, it's something that, you know, being able to dialogue with other doctors is, is really helpful. You know, there were other cases not even related to the implants that I would just bounce ideas off of with, um, you know, the colleagues. And so getting different people's perspectives, you know, just listening to some of their cases that they've been, you know, just dealing with in private practice as well, uh, really was, was interesting. And so a lot of that, uh, you know, the uh, learning happens, you know, when you're on break, it happens when you're eating lunch or whatever. And, and the food actually is quite good too. So that's, that's been great. Um, but yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, certainly feel free to reach out. Um, you know, my email is there. Um, and I'll put Dr. Kim is going to talk a little bit more about the other side of this case as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Stone. I appreciate it. It's uh, an amazing uh, uh, case. I know working on this, even with the Dr. Uh, Howard as well. Um, I, I have to say that, you know, uh, with the uh, Tristan background in restorative dentistry, it's easier to, um, to manage cases in both res restoratively driven uh, implant dentistry. This is what matters. And I'm so proud that you went from uh, the, uh, the level of surgery that you started with all the way to the to the level that you are at now with combining both restorative and um, and uh, surgical skills. So, thank you. I don't think there's any question uh, uh, for uh, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Howard will talk more about the immediate implant placement in the molar area down the line. Uh, so uh, let's. Uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Kenny Howard uh, uh, from Tri Cities in East Washington. So, Dr. Howard, whenever you're ready, please feel free to share your screen. We're running over time, like it's already 10 minutes past our two hours, so probably we'll shoot for another uh, half an hour, hopefully, and the uh, probably the CE hours that we'll providing will be two and a half hours. So. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Stone. Are we sharing? Yes. We can okay. See it. I had trouble with this earlier for those of you listening. I had to bring my 18 year old son in to help me figure this out and I'm not afraid to admit it. So um, I had uh, two topics for today, but this topic relates more to um, what Tristan just finished up with and something that I think I'll use in my practice uh, quite a bit. Uh, it has to do with placing an immediate implant when the tooth is present. So this is my family. This is, this is why I do what I do so that I can spend more time with them. Uh, this this um, lecture series, the surgical series, took away from my family um, to go do this but it was invaluable. Um, what I learned over the last year has taken me from where I was to where I am now. I started practicing 20 years ago and I'm a family practice. Um, I place a lot of onesie twosies. 10 years ago, I went through one of these, you know, boot camps where you learn how to place an implant um, uh, over the weekend and you go back and you're all excited. I'm gonna go place implants. I've got this figured out. Well, what I found out was that I got into some complex cases that scared me away. Um, I'm a cautious person and uh, I found that uh, I, I really got timid about the implants. So about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I started talking to Dr. Yassine about taking his class. And um, what I found out was that this class really pushed me um, to beyond my comfort zone. And it allowed me to realize that a lot of these procedures are, um, are easy enough for all of us to perform in our general practice. And the fact that we know what we want it to look like when it finishes, you know, uh, everyone's thrown out, uh, I call them yes, um, 
things that he says throughout the year. And one of the things that he says and is adamant about is begin with the end in mind. You know, what we want to accomplish is, is where we need to figure out um, our, our game plan from. Uh, it's not simply throw an implant in the bone, which some of my specialists that refer, I referred to, um, you know, that's their philosophy. Where the bone is is where the implant belongs, but I have to restore it. And I have to, you know, try and take these angulations, these teeth that aren't in ideal bone and create something the patient is happy with. Because in the end, the general dentist is the one that uh, is responsible. Uh, I would highly recommend this class. Uh, anyone that would like to contact me who's conservative and doesn't think that this is uh, for them, uh, I'd gladly talk to them. So let's go ahead here. So we're going to do a uh, tooth guided implant. Um, we're, we're going to back up. Uh, Tristan already kind of talked about our patient, so I, I'm not really going to delve too much into his medical history. He's a um, pretty healthy guy, everything um, about him. His brother was his previous dentist, which, you know, kind of adds to things. Um, it, it definitely, there's, there's the fact that you're always going to hear, well, my brother said, or this or that, and Tristan's nodding his head right now, so he knows. Um, and I'm sure all of us have seen this at one point in our practice. Um, we've talked about the fact that 29 is broken off at the gum line and that we're dealing with some recur recurrent decay and some edentulous spaces. So again, you, we just saw these photos with um, Dr. Stone and you know, this is stuff we see every day in our practice. This is why I really, really enjoyed this um, surgical experience because this is what my practice is. So here's our patient again. Um, we can see that our nerve is a long ways away from where we want to work. Um, so his treatment options, and Tristan talked about some of these, you know, we can do nothing. Um, we can extract 29 and 30 and prosthesis. We can do removable. We can do fixed. In this case, um, you know, our patient would like to have something that stays in his mouth. So my goal um, and what I expect here is that I'm going to be able to extract 29 and 30 and place um, implants in these locations. I'm probably going to have to bone graft to fill the gap and, um, you know, a collagen plug over, over the top of the bone graft before I attempt primary closure. Um, you know, so we're constantly thinking about the ideal place to place our implants. And in this case, we're going to use what we have to help us accomplish that. Um, 29, uh, pretty straightforward. You know, you're, you're going to extract the tooth and you're going to try and engage some of that bone at the apical portion um, to, you know, get some initial stability for the implant. 30. Now, 30 is why we're here. 30 is a technique that um, I saw Dr. Yassin do, and I'm sure others do it, but you use the tooth in its location to help guide you for its ideal placement, thereby, um, you know, getting your ideal occlusal load because you place this implant in inner radicular bone where you want it to be and you'll be establishing this implant where the tooth used to be. Um, first off, let's uh, thank Acteon for the use of their cube. Uh, I initially used um, Acteon with its luxators to um, luxate the tooth around in the sockets. You can see here we extracted it really straightforward. Some of these root canal teeth, um, you and I all know that are they're very complex sometimes. They just they don't want to come out of these sockets. Because we're not really here to talk about number 29, we placed 29 in, we engaged it apically, we got some good primary stability. So the tooth of interest is number 30. You start first by cutting the crown off of number 30, and I used a hand piece because, you know, I use them day in and day out. But the piezoelectric does have a, um, uh, an attachment called a, a ninja, which you could use to cut that tooth off too. So here's our tooth. We've sectioned it. Our first implant, we placed it ideally where we want it. We have to keep into consideration, um, you know, 
things that like Dr. Kang talked about a few minutes ago where we can't have our implants too close together. We have to be aware of our bone and um, yet we can use this tooth and the way it sits to help us guide where that, that implant's gonna end up. So in this case, um, we, we sat down, we looked, and we decided that we were gonna use BioHorizons immediate implant. And it is a big implant. It's a seven millimeter diameter implant that engages both the buccal and lingual bone um, uh, to get its primary retention. So here we go, we, we start the osteotomy right down the center of this tooth. We wanna make sure we, um, I'm sorry, I'm pointing with my fingers right now. <laughs> we wanna make sure that we're aligning that osteotomy with our previous implant so that when Dr. Stone comes back later to restore this, everything is where it should be. In this case, um, we step up our um, drill sizes to about two sizes below our final our final drill and you can see that's a large diameter um, now what we're going to do is we're going to pull that ninja out we're going to take that piezoelectric and we're going to use this to section the tooth and the rest of its pieces we'll take um, our luxator um, attachment for the piezoelectric and i use that i did run into a complication where um, we actually had some ankylosis of the root, so it wasn't, um, you know, completely straightforward. Then we're going to um, take our implant, and again, this is, you know, Dr. Yassine, again, you have one shot at this to engage it. And we engage it in that radicular bone. We can see we had some nice parallelisms. Now, um, as we look down um, onto these two implants, we can see we need to fill that jumping distance um, with a bone graft, in which case we were using the BioHorizons, um, a mixed particle size. We'll place the collar plug, in this case we use the BioHorizons collar plug, over the top of that bone graft and then suture for primary closure. Now this again is you know, one of my shortcomings, um, my sutures were inadequate. And, um, you know, Dr. Yassine politely asked if he might help a little. And he came in here and he showed me, you know, that I have to make sure that I close this space off. Um, I, I went quick. This was one of two uh, topics I had, but I, I just want to make sure that I thank Dr. Yassine um, Valerie was wonderful. She's always making sure that we have what we need. Um, Jennifer Music was our assistant. Um, she sat chairside with us when one of the doctors wasn't available. And with her years of um, surgical experience, um, she was very helpful. And then the doctors. And we had plenty of sponsors. If you do take this course, you'll find out that um, the sponsors supply a lot of equipment and supplies that um, would be very expensive otherwise and probably make this course a lot, lot more expensive than it is. Okay, that was the first topic. Do you want me to do go you have ahead? A, do, you, do you have a, um, any picture of the adjusted sutures? What was wrong with, with your suture if you wanna criticize your suturing and just like teach us something? I, I did not include my, uh, your uh, beautiful sutures after um, my attempt. Uh, okay, so let's go back to your sutures and teach us something about your sutures, what should not do. Okay, just a second here. So in the case of, um, let me see, am I sharing here? Uh, not yet. I'm not yet, okay. I wish I could use that as my excuse right now, but hold on just a second. <laughs> uh, go back to screen share. Well, first off, I left the gap in here. 
my knots were less than adequate. Mm -hmm. And with this gap, that's a great place for infection to start, for the collar plug, you know, we already know how fragile they are to begin with, for it to dissolve away and to lose the bone particles. So I, I did not, I did not close this gap enough to um, gain primary closure. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, are you expected to do a primary closure and an immediate implant placement, especially with the molar having big, big, uh, big opening? Well, if we're going to place a bone graft, um, I would say yes. If if we weren't placing a bone graft in there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right. We need to have a, some kind of sealing, right? Either by custom healing abutment or trying with. You have a great tissues. This is what I uh, I wanted to share with with the group and everybody's watching. That you have nice attached gingiva. You take advantage of this and get this uh, primary closure, especially that we're not using custom healing abutment. The most important thing in immediate implant that we can support the soft tissue by a custom healing abutment, which will support positively uh, uh, to the to the bone underneath it. So. This is why I said, like, you have a great situation. It's going to heal eventually here with your sutures, but why not to uh, save more of the, but the attached gingiva and the keratinized tissue and make sure that it's, it's a good position. So thank you. I just wanted to share this because it's a learning tip uh, with, with everybody around, and uh, I, I just wanted to share with it. Okay, so uh, we have... Uh, Five minutes to go. You still have another uh, another presentation or another case. Oh, me. Oh, yep. sorry. Yep, I do. This is the one that um, really pushed the limit of things for me. So um, where's my screen share? Let's see here. Screen share. This one's not going to take five minutes, but okay. Let's... Let's go ahead here and we'll give it a try. Let me grab it. I just pressed save, so now we gotta wait a second. Okay. Uh, slideshow. Okay, so we know my name and we don't need to talk about the course code right now. So this case is a, a sinus elevation. So our reason for doing a sinus elevation um, is that the maxillary sinus lacks enough bone for long-term stability of the implant. I'm gonna go through this kind of fast because we are pressed for time. But again, this all has to do with the final prosthesis and knowing what we're gonna do down the road. This is Lester. Lester would like to have teeth in his mouth that will not be falling out. Lester has extracted many of his own teeth. So, you know, he, he smokes, he drinks once in a while. He has had a heart attack in the past. We're not gonna dwell too much on medical history here because we are limited for time. We can see Lester's smile here. You know, he has edentulous areas where, again, we can see atrophy of the bone, periodontal disease. We see his pano. We notice the sinuses, which is my area of interest right now are um, large, there's atrophy of bone, we don't, you know, and there's no alveolar ridge left, lots of decay. This is another one of Dr. Polson's patients. He likes the tough cases. So uh, with Lester, you know, we can continue to do nothing, let him continue to take his own teeth out. We can do something that's removable, or in this case, uh, an implant-borne um, prosthesis of some sort. So in order to do that, we need to have long-term um, stability of these implants. We want to place some far enough back that we take into consider the AP position and the forces that will be on the final prosthesis. My portion of Lester's rehab, and this, this was a case that was done all in one day at the clinic. Lester sat from 7 in the morning, uh, 8 in the morning until about 7 at night. Um, he got a wonderful um, service out of this. But I'm going to be uh, doing a lateral sinus wall lift with a um, bone graft so that we can try and place an implant 
in the three, four location. Again, this is way beyond anything I would ever have attempted in my own practice. Um, but I think it makes you realize what you can accomplish if you want to. I'm not, I'm going to briefly go over this. Um, there's a couple ways to do a sinus, um, you know, a sinus lift. We can do a bump, um, which a lot of people do. In this case, he is missing so much bone that um, we can't do a bump. Um, a lateral sinus wall um, approach is what we're looking at, where we uh, reflect the tissue, remove some bone, and um, place a graft. There are some things to watch out for. Dr. Polson talked about these earlier. We're worried about perfing the membrane. We're worried about um, any arteries that we might nick on the way in. And cysts, um, a CBCT is a must. It allows us to see what's going on inside the mouth, uh, inside the bone. It allows us to um, figure out how thick the bone is and to design our approach um, for the window from the um, anterior to posterior and the inferior to the superior aspects of that. Here you can see our axial wall view of the CBCT and you know it's about a millimeter thick. Our coronal view lets you see how wide that area is um, from the lateral to medial wall. Um, it also shows you that maybe we have an artery up here that we might deal with some bleeding but we'll deal with it if it becomes an issue. And the sagittal view is probably the most important. It helps you to design where you're going to place this implant. Dr. Polson talked earlier about, you know, how, how high we want the window up. In this case, um, you know, initially I had thought we should go um, a millimeter from the alveolar ridge and then four millimeters up. Things change as we get involved. I had designed um, the window to be farther away from the premolar. Um, we changed that as we went to um, design it also. So there's a couple ways to do um, a lateral sinus wall lift. There's a drill technique where you remove all the bone or there's the window technique where you remove around the bone and create this free floating window. So, uh, you know, uh, a Yassinism begin with the end in mind. So our goal is to create enough bone in the maxillary sinus to allow for the implant to be retained, uh, replaced and retained, and more importantly, that the implant be in a position for that final restorative goal. Um, flap design, you know, um, we're pinched for time, but we're gonna do a full, thic full thickness flap um, with re releasing incisions, allowing us to see um, the bone that we're trying to access. You know, Lester had a whole bunch of surgery done that day. The incisions were already made. Dr. Polson actually made the incisions um, and released these flaps before I entered in. Um, you know, window design, we have to take into consideration a few things. Um, we have to consider where that implant is going to be. We have to consider our borders um, for the window. Uh, and I am, you know, kind of skipping some things here we need to decide how big that window is going to be uh, from, from the, um, the anterior to posterior, from the lower wall to the, to the upper aspect of that border. And then we want to create a window that's oval instead of rectangle to help prevent any kind of um, uh, tearing or ripping of the Snyderian membrane. Someone already stole my pictures earlier today. Um, I have to admit this is again outside my comfort zone. So um, I practiced on a dozen eggs. Uh, these were the ones that survived. So, okay. So what you're looking at here, um, I had taken a high speed with a round burr um, and I had started to create my window. I measured up four millimeters and another four millimeters back from where that premolar was. Um, and then eight millimeters to the upper aspect and about 10 to 12 millimeters posterior. You remove just enough bone that there's a um, light layer just over that tissue. And then we pulled out the um, piezoelectric and um, I knew from the CBCT that that bone was somewhere around a millimeter thick. So once I had gotten to that level with the round burr, 
we pulled out um, the piezoelectric and um, used another round bird that's on there and you can be so much more delicate. I, I really thought this, um, this was gonna be something where I push too hard and I'm through the membrane and everyone has that gasping moment. We all had them, by the way, just so you know. Over the last year, I probably had two or three situations where I felt where it was beyond um, my capability. And, you know, uh, Dr. Yassine comes up and um, he reassures you. Everyone takes a deep breath. You uh, look at the situation again and you go forward. I mean, I, I never felt like um, I was endangering the patient, but I did feel like I pushed myself. Um, so all those are good things. You need to push your limit. So here, here is um, the window. After I had started to use the piezoelectric, you can see the Snyderian membrane there. I still have some bone present here that I need to remove, but you're slowly teasing that instrument around and you're removing the bone. Once the bone is removed, um, you now need to elevate the Snyderian membrane away from the bone and you start with a hand instrument and you start in the most anterior aspect because you don't want to tear it. I mean, anterior and superior because you really want to stay away from tearing it um, on the lower borders because it's a lot harder to deal with the complications. So initially um, a rounded um, blunt instrument um, out of uh, Dr. Yassine's bag of tricks. Um, I don't know the name of the instrument, but you'll find out when things get stressful, he has this bag of tricks and he grabs it and it has things in it that I'm sure make his life easier um, on a daily basis. So um, once it was slightly laid with a hand instrument, um, we pulled out the piezoelectric and applied this elephant foot. And they have several different you can see down here, several different attachments to help elevate that tissue. So the elephant foot, you just slowly work your way around the membrane or around the bone. Oh, let me go back here. I wanna, I wanna point out one thing. So it, it was very beneficial that other people, mainly Justin had performed two of these ahead of me and I had sat chair side with him for two. One of the things I noticed is that, you know, before we start relieving that tissue, we need to smooth this bone all the way around. And um, the first time Justin attempted it, he was trying to smooth it after it was already moving and it's a lot more tricky. And we all learn from what's going on. And um, So before, before I relieved the bone completely, I went in and tried to smooth the bone so that I didn't have one of those uh-oh moments where I look at Alan and say, hey, save me here. <laughs> um, yeah, he laughs, but the rest of us, the blood pressure goes. Woo. Good. Listen, uh, Kenny, uh, it's really a great presentation. I, I really want go. Nicole to share. So go ahead and share with us the last couple of slides of your surgery. I know this case was sh share the video if you want, oh. and 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 share share with us the the last couple of uh, videos. Sure. Um, Okay, I'm gonna, I'll go real quick here. So this video is just showing, using an instrument near the end where I'm trying to relieve the, the um, tissue um, along the floor to the medial wall. And then once it's fully relieved and you know that it is because you can watch it move in and out. And um, I tried sending this video to my wife and she said there's no way she was opening it to watch it, so. Um, but it was really neat because there weren't any perforations, so you got to watch that membrane move in and out. Um, we don't need to talk about that. So this is the one thing I'm going to throw in real quick, mainly because Justin threw me under the bus earlier. One of the things that I find interesting is the PRF and sticky bone. We had mixed results throughout the year, um, but we tried, and Alan was more than willing to look at different techniques, but here's, here's sticky bone that... Um, that, that Dr. Polson used on the other sinus on the opposite side earlier in the morning. Uh, so as we get towards our final films, you know, uh, we placed in the resorbable membrane once everything was relieved. We then placed in a bone graft to help create a tent to get 
the tissue and the bone away from where we were going to place our implant. And again, this is one of those moments where he likes to say, okay, you got one shot and you're like, crap, I got one shot. So um, we did the initial osteotomy. I had a millimeter of bone. We left, um, we left the uh, osteotomy size two sizes short because we were so worried about any retention and holy smokes, we got it. 20 Newton um, centimeters. I mean, Hey, that's pretty cool. So then the implants in, we went back with our bone grafting material and um, placed a resorbable membrane. You want to make sure it extends three millimeters beyond the bone. And this guy had been sitting around with us all day and if I would have had to suture this up, it would have been another hour and a half. And Alan jumped in. And this is this is the kind of guy he is. He gets done, and I'm looking at it going, dang, that's nice. And all he could do was critique himself and say how he should have made this look better. And I did not include a film. Sorry, Dr. Yassine. I'll do that next time. But it was wonderful. I mean, everything was closed, primary closure. And it took him 20 minutes. The rest of us would have been sitting there just, you know, struggling. But um, these are the kind of cases you guys can look to see um, if you head to the AGD clinic next year um, and become part of this. Uh, it was wonderful. I learned a lot. Um, again, I'll probably mainly do onesie twosies, but I'm not afraid to try a bone graft now. Um, I've done several in my practice. And the rest is just nothing. So that, that was the, um, the lateral wall sinus lift. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. I have to say that, uh, you know, uh, those kind of advanced cases comes at the end towards the end of the program. So uh, this kind of case, we were, uh, as you saw the x-ray on the on the uh, panoramic x-ray, it's critical. It's uh, ideal all on four case where we do the lateral implants with tilted angulation. In our case here, we wanted to give the patient six implants and practice uh, sinus elevation, which uh, both were successful, both sides. Uh, so it's more about practicing and getting into the uh, into more practical work. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ken. I'm so proud of your level. We still have this awesome uh, session coming in August 15th. Now, the last is the best our amazing and smart Dr. Nicole O'Brien, uh, who is, uh, she practices here in Seattle, next, next door to me in the university district. So Dr. O'Brien, uh, please uh, start sharing your screen. Looking forward to see uh, your presentation. Please welcome Dr. Nicole with me. Hi there, everybody. Hello. All right, be patient with me. I think one of the things I spent the most uh, time working on this year was all of the technology that we used. So um, that's, a, that's been a really good learning experience as well. We came long way with all this Dropbox and, and uh, um, you know, we have, we have partnership with the Plan Mecca, which they have Romexis software. So, uh, yeah, we're getting, we're getting a lot of technology on board. Yeah, definitely. All right, so as Dr. Yassine said, I practice in the university district. I'm a general practitioner. I graduated from Boston University in 2005, and I love restorative dentistry, uh, have restored lots of implants. And there's been those times where I think, boy, this case would have been nice to have more control over or uh, even something that wasn't quite what I wanted from a restorative um, standpoint. And I have all these sort of idols and mentors and it's been really fun to see how um, reading journal articles or going to study clubs can translate into actually getting to do a lot of this um, clinical work yourself. So, uh, oops. So, Patients like this come into my practice probably once a month, you know, these uh, accidents or previous uh, dentistry that's failing. And I look at this and think, boy, if I could move this patient into treatment right away in my own practice, 
they're gonna get a better aesthetic result. Uh, they're probably gonna be more motivated to complete their treatment than if I have to be going through you know, multiple referrals and, and follow up. So uh, this is a really good example of something I see very regularly in my practice. And of course, seeing people like this, some idols, um, you might recognize Dr. Dennis Tarnow. Uh, this is one of those kind of gods in dentistry that really inform um, how we get the results that we we're looking for from a and scientific standpoint. Nicole, can, can I stop you here? Because yeah. I, I don't see that you're sharing uh, other than your presentation here. So I don't know if you want to stop sharing and share your presentation again, because it's just freezed. Oh, sorry. Uh, we see your name, but uh, we, we, we don't see. So just hit okay. stop sharing and sharing again. Oh, that's it. So you see down probably hit enable editing on the top. Yes, and then just do the, the you need to share your screen again. Yeah, sorry, it just, it went, it defaulted. Yeah. And then, and then just uh, enlarge your uh, PowerPoint presentation from here, the lower right. Or just press F5 to play the uh, slides. Oh, you have a Mac? You. No. <laughs> <laughs> lower right. Where the, I'll hey, send my son this... over. Yeah, where, where's your son, Kenny? That right. would be helpful. <laughs> Go to the right again. Another right. one. Hang on a second. My uh... sorry, guys. The ah, good. Awesome. Perfect. In good yeah. shape. Okay. <laughs> So well, uh, yeah. this was what I was talking about. So um, this is an example of something I see in the practice really regularly and, and why I was motivated to take this course. Uh, so I last August uh, saw Dr. Saw Dr. Is that getting really for you guys too? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, um, so Dr. Tarnow spoke uh, through a Washington AGD sponsored event last August and I actually met Dr. Yassine and Valerie at that course and just felt really motivated to learn more. So he's always been an idol of mine from a restorative standpoint. And then of course, having great mentors like Alan who took lots of time out to come and help, help me, um, so thank you. And friends like these, you guys have been a really great um, support group and I've learned so much from everyone. So this was a big motivator for me to take this course this year. So I'll talk about Jeff, a 51 year old male, a new patient to my practice and was really just looking to get a checkup. And I asked him um, if he had any pain, any concerns he was walking around with this fractured off number eight and wasn't motivated to do anything. So we talked about, um, sorry, his answer to that was that no, he didn't have any aesthetic concerns. I was able to kind of uh, discuss with him the potential for infection in that space. Um, there is some research uh, that talks about in, in a 24 hour period, you can actually see periridicular um, migration of bacteria and therefore possible infection. So even those patients that don't wanna do treatment, at least sealing over that um, gutta percha would be important to maybe provide a clean environment. And for me, um, as I go through treatment options, it's really important to talk about you know, all of the options um, everything we can do down to no treatment and some kind of sort of stabilization. So about a year ago, he chose 
stabilize it, I guess. So um, put some composite over that gutta percha after you know cleaning it, putting a little sodium hypochlorite in there, and then try to earn his trust and just talk to him at recalls about moving into treatment. Actually, I want to talk about this picture. The tissue uh, at this time looked really good. And so sort of leaving that root tip as a space holder, uh, my hope was it would just maintain papilla and the bone uh, in that site. And then he eventually decided to become a participant in our course. Uh, the cone beam shows that he's got a nice type one socket. So good preservation of that labial plate. And he had about eight uh, or so millimeters of width. So ample amount for an immediate implant. And then the um, surgical plan was a traumatic or a minimally traumatic extraction. Um, the osteotomy, uh, we talk about kind of this bias palatal placement to allow for preservation of that labial plate. Um, we also did a um, flapless uh, um, surgery so that we could maintain that blood supply. Uh, as we know, there's three sources of blood supply. And one of them is that, um, that facial periosteum. So when we reflect a flap, we lose one of those major um, areas of blood supply. The periosteum of the tooth is the other source of blood. So once we've extracted that tooth, it's gonna be critical to try to preserve as much blood supply for the implant and the tissue as we can. Um, placed a tapered implant, did a healing abutment and he declined any kind of need for a provisional. I offered an Essex retainer as follow-up and he was uninterested. Uh, I put this slide up because I, I looked at the case uh, couple weeks ago as I was doing the final impression and I noticed he had some uh, recession, especially at that distal where that um, number seven, the, the bone was fairly thin. And I think in hindsight, doing some kind of maybe custom healing abutment would have helped support that tissue a little better. This article is um, from a Tarnow paper um, in uh, 2014, I believe. And it's basically talking about the change in the width of that labial bone uh, in different instances. So immediate implant placement and just placing the um, healing abutment or actually going through and doing a custom abutment. One was with a custom abutment and some bone grafting and then finally just some bone grafting. And the results of this basically say that you're going to get the least amount of change if you do a some kind of provisional, so either a custom abutment, healing abutment, or an actual provisional restoration and do some bone grafting. Um, so I think in this case, it would have been nice to at least do, we, we did do some bone grafting at the time, so to do a little bit of a custom abutment to kind of support or push that tissue, hold that tissue, uh, would have probably stabilized it a bit more than what our final, my final result was. So this was at his uh, impression appointment. You can see that tissue is healed really well um, right up over the healing abutment. And the placement I thought looked great. Um, maybe a little close to the lateral incisor. And again, I think that's why I lost a little bit of bone. I have a radiograph I'll show you here in just a moment. I always do close, um, sorry, open tray. Um, I think that you get better stabilization. Uh, I think it's easier for the lab technician to work with it. You just have less chance of, of that little bit of error. So I am always open tray. And then he actually came in. You guys remember Jeff, he was not aesthetically motivated at all. Um, he came in asking me if he could have a metal crown. And I told him we could do something like that. He would have to pay for gold costs. Uh, it was kind of an unusual ask. And he said, well, how about if we just make it really white? So I'm holding the shade guide up and this is what he chose, which is always kind of a heartbreaker because while he said he didn't have any aesthetic concerns, I have aesthetic concerns with something <laughs> I'm gonna put in his mouth, but I guess the patient gets to choose. 
And so here's my, um, my radiograph at the time of the final impression. You can see the, bone, the crustal bone at the uh, mesial of number nine looks quite good. We maintain that level. That mesial of number seven, we had some recession there. And you'll also notice how he's got that sort of concavity in that root. So as that gum and bone receded, uh, that funny concavity was exposed. And I'll talk about what I did to compensate for that restoratively. And so here is that try-in. Um, you can see I ended up uh, adding some composite at the mesial gingival area on number seven, there wasn't going to be a way for Obad to actually try to help me create that, um, that distance that we're going for. So from the crustal bone to the implant, we're shooting for about a five millimeter distance where the contact point would be so that we could reform papilla. But because of that concavity and that bone loss, we had to almost create a guide plane so that we had some way to build the contact more apically. So I ended up placing some uh, direct restoration there to try to build that out uh, so that we could move the contact point apically. And then the overall, the abutment is too far super gingivally. I ended up in measuring this, I had about six millimeters of space from the top of the platform of the implant to the crestal bone, or to the, I'm sorry, the free gingival margin. So I think in hindsight, it was placed a little too deeply. And that's probably something that newbies worry, you know, are, are prone to do. Um, negotiating that osteotomy and the implant placement, especially with that uh, lingual placement, it was hard to tell, I was shooting obviously for that, that three millimeters we talk about from the CEJ of the adjacent teeth, you know, to the base of the implant. But I think um, the placement ended up being too deep. So the soft tissue model from the lab actually looked very similar to what we see clinically. So I fixed this by adding the composite on seven, taking several photographs, remeasuring and mapping out, and then returning the case to Obad. So I did a pickup impression of the crown. Um, you can also see the difference in the shade. I did this more for my own knowledge or to talk about what I would do if aesthetically I had this case show up and, and the shade was wrong because of a lab error. Let's actually use some composite tinting material to kind of dial in what I think the shade should be so that when I return the crown to the lab, he can see what the maybe error was. Jeff wants it this white, but from my photos and just you know to kind of play around and show you guys some examples of what I think is a good chair side technique if you have to communicate with your lab on the fly. So kind of did some, some painting of this unesthetic crown and then talked to him about where I wanted to move the margin of the custom abutment to and also how I wanna change that S curve and where I want to move the crown margin um, to as well, where I want him to start trying to uh, improve my emergence profile of the crown to support that uh, papilla, particularly at the mesial. The distal half, I think we're going to end up with kind of that long wall contact that you sometimes get when you have some recession around these cases. So. I think uh, I have to just comment here if you go back yeah. to this uh, uh, yes, this slide. This is probably one of your first implant or the first ever that you placed and you're restoring, right? Yeah. Which yeah. is a great experience for you to, uh, you know, get better understanding for the restoration and to reflect back on your surgical uh, technique. Yeah. One, any immediate implant in general, in general, should be placed a little bit deeper or will be placed deeper, as we know and we discussed. I don't believe that you placed it deeper than uh, supposed to be. Okay. You did a great job with this. Uh, I, I think the key point with any immediate implant in the aesthetic zone is the steps that we do. One, as you mentioned, the support for the soft tissue with custom healing abutment is really a great benefit in, in any immediate implant. 
especially to support the soft tissue, stabilize the gingival margin, and vice versa will stabilize the bone underneath it. So this is one. Uh, we learned this down the line in the aesthetic zone uh, uh, um, module. Probably this one was too early in the program where we were starting to focus mainly on uh, uh, the technique of implant placement. Second, when we do this kind of cases, it's also important to consider soft tissue grafting at one point, either at the time of the placement, extraction and placement, or either at the temporization time. So think about it this way. This case, we did the extraction, we put solid healing abutment, everything went fine, and then the patient came back. Remember when we talked about the level of the custom uh, final uh, custom custom abutment? You see, this is the problem here is where to put the uh, line of the cu the custom abutment underneath the gingival margin. Mm -hmm. I would go probably with temporary abutment for some time, trying to uh, reshape my gingival margins. Probably you can practice doing soft tissue augmentation, connective tissue graft to support the uh, buccal area, the facial, and probably support the papilla. You did a great job with this five millimeter between the contact point and the crystal bone to, to try to create the papilla. Uh, and, and then after we finalize uh, probably three to six months of temporary crown, placement, we come back and do the final crown. So this is how we learn, right? You're doing the restoration right now on your own implant, and you're just trying to work on your lab technician to go ahead and do the best result possible. Uh, I love how you're dealing with stuff, especially with this composite trick that you're going to show us right now, right? Yeah. Um, so I guess that that is one Obad and I talked through provisionalization versus going to final. And I know, you know, there's a, there's, can be a debate about if your biology is correct, then provisionalization can just be an extra step or an expense for the patient, right? So if you can follow the, Obad fully feels like he should have uh, designed the abutment and the crown margin, that emergence profile differently. We looked at this together and he's like, yeah, I, I definitely ended up too super gingival. Right. So I, I used to always do uh, provisionalization and tissue grooming. Mm -hmm. I have heard some people talk about the, the chance for recession or bone loss every time you're removing that provisional. So you're mm -hmm. tearing that hemidemosomal attachment that you start to form, you actually can irritate the tissue more. And I know John Coy says, if you followed all your rules and your measurements from your implant platform to your crestal bone or where the crestal bone heals to on the adjacent tooth, you should very predictably, even if at the day of insertion of your final crown, you don't have papilla, it will develop, it will happen. Like the physiology and the biology what means it might take six months, but you will absolutely develop that if your math is correct. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think, what your comment would yes, be. Yes, absolutely, that's, that's, that's correct. Uh, but the, the thing is uh, we want to, uh, so thankfully this patient is not too demanding, yeah. right? <laughs> so one, two, this is your first implant that you're restoring. So it's a, lear a good learning curve, right? So, uh, and, and you see from yourself, I think with those kind of cases, um, doing some temporary and doing a soft tissue at the time of the temporary to stabilize it. This case, we have some facial deficiency, as you could see from the, the shot coming from, from the occlusal shot. Mm -hmm. So it's eligible for some soft tissue augmentation. Where, when should we do it? The best way to do it at the time of the placement, 
but we have another chance to do it is with the temporary where we can get two in one we can th uh, like take in this tissue and and get another shot for our papilla if needed just to make it uh, thicker. Personally, when I deal with anterior cases, I do one step for restoration is the custom abutment try-in. So before I ask my, my uh, um, lab technician to finalize the custom abutment, I tell him, come, let's try it. Let's see the margins. Where are you putting your margins? It's different intraorally just because yeah. an extra step about it. In the PROS literature, and I know prostodontists, they, they love to talk about one abutment, one attachment. Don't remove the abutment a, a lot, right? So uh, in surgical, in my, in my surgical background, uh, uh, if you have your measurements correct, even if you had a little bit of damage to the attachment, things will get back to, to normal. And there's a huge discussion right now with your final surface of the abutment or the restoration, the one that is attaching the, the gingiva. Are we going to do some etching into it to leave the gingiva a little bit more uh, um, attaching more strictly firmly to the abutment. This is kind of this new concept, new old concept. It's nothing new, but this is also with the concept of zero bone loss with zero soft tissue loss that uh, the uh, uh, prostodontist in Lithuania talking about uh, recently in the last couple of years. So uh, yeah, so that's- micro etching in the abutment or something? Correct, using zirconium abutment, micro etching, uh, or even don't really uh, do glaze to finalize this final uh, underneath the, uh, the tissue subgingival uh, surface. So great discussion, I, I love it. Let's let's move on and-, and My and last talk. slide is just showing that product and I use this a lot for lab communication. I use it for provisionalization for anterior cases. It's a great product to just have in your back pocket. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's it. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Yassine and Valerie for everything. Everyone in the group has been awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much, Nicole. Amazing discussion. I love it. And um, thank you, everybody, for this amazing uh, presentation. I wanted to make sure that before we finish the program, everybody feels uh, confident not only <laughs> in surgical skills, but also in other uh, skills like uh, public speaking, presenting. We've we've done a lot of uh, presenting through through the the last academic year. So uh, good job! I'm so proud of every single person of you. As I mentioned before, uh, we have uh, 2020, 2021 class coming uh, starting in September. Uh, we, I think Valerie could correct me. We still have two, three slots open. Uh, so if you're interested, please reach out to Valerie to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry uh, or at the website to follow the uh, cl clinical implantology A to Z on, on, on the social media. That would be great as well. Um, look into the modules as well. If you feel that you don't want to uh, do the full module, the full course from uh, module one until module 10, you can pick and choose in several other modules um, uh, if you feel like you're interested in either beginner level or more advanced level. Uh, other than this, I uh, thank you so much. We still have one more session, surgical session to go. It's August 15th and 16th. We'll be seeing patients here in Seattle. Uh, so um, we'll see you soon, uh, doctors, for our uh, meeting, Zoom meeting, to finalize the cases. And of course, uh, because we had this uh, pandemic this year, uh, we're going to be discussing with the current class how they can come next year to uh, to you know restore what we what we missed in this in this class and also to help us as a, a graduate alumni uh, instructors in the in the clinic. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, I hope that we covered everything. We went a little bit over time, an hour. It was a lot of discussion. I think Valerie will pass two and a half hours, CE hours for the participants. Uh, and thanks again to the University of Washington who is gonna provide everybody with the CE hours. Thank you so much and have a good day.
Okay, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank Bye. you for joining us today and Dr. Yassin for your mad, marvelous work. Thank you, my friends. Have Appreciate a great it. day. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye, the sun. Bye, you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>